Okay, so welcome everyone to the 77th lecture of Dr. Hadi Step 1. Uh, before we begin, uh, can we ask that whether you guys can hear our voice? If you guys can, can we get a yes in the chat box, please? Okay, hope you guys have been well. Thank you so much for making it to today's lecture. Um, <clears throat> how are you guys doing? Are you guys doing okay, everyone? How are you guys? Good? Okay, good. that's very good to know. Were you guys able to solve uh, questions or complete the homework from yesterday? Okay, were you guys able to complete the homework from yesterday? So shall we begin with the lecture for today and uh, test whether you guys have done the homework at the end of the lecture? Okay, so we are going to begin with the lecture straight away. Um, so, so far we have finished microbiology as a whole. We have finished all of antibiotics. And today we will finish everything off with anti uh, with antimycology or antifungal drugs and antiviral drugs. So that's what we will do. Before we begin, let me just share my screen real quick and um, let me get this started. Okay. And there you guys are. So can you guys see my screen over here? Is... Okay, good. Okay. So let's begin with antifungal therapy. Okay, is everyone ready to begin antifungals? <clears throat> Everyone, are we ready? Okay, Dr. Karbasi, Dr. Iman. Dr. Karbasi said yes two times. Okay, Dr. Dahlia. Okay, Dr. Nau. Okay, so let's get this started. Okay, so everyone is ready. Now, before we start talking about uh, antifungal drugs, first of, first and foremost, I want to talk about the structure of the fungus itself. I, I know you guys have, saw this coming. So that's what it is. We have, we have to talk about the structure of the fungi first, and then we'll talk about all the drugs which works on different um, layers of the fungus. So that's what we would do. So just as how we drew the bacteria, uh, we would be doing the same with uh, the fungi. And um, just give me one more second over here. Okay, okay. So let's suppose that this is the fungus as a whole, okay? And we would like to assume that this portion of the fungi is the cell membrane, okay? And this outer portion is the cell wall, okay? This is the cell membrane, this is the cell wall, okay? So now what we have over here is we have the fungal nuclei, okay? We have the fungal nuclei and in the fungal nuclei, obviously we have the fungal genome that is the fungal DNA. So, that, so that's over there. So, so far we have drawn the cell wall that's over here. Then we draw the cell, and then we do the cell membrane. Now we are drawing um, the nuclear, the fungal nucleus. And now we will draw the different reactions that happens over here that is required to maintain the integrity of the fungal cell membrane. So what's, ha what's happening over here is over here you have squalene. Okay, so squalene is a is a type of protein-like structure that is converted. That is converted. So squalene is converted to squalene epoxide. Squalene is converted to squalene epoxide by squalene epoxidase. Okay, by squalene epoxidase. So squalene is converted 
to squalene ep epoxide by squalene epoxidase, that squalene epoxide is converted to lanosterol, to lanosterol, lano, lanosterol. This is, the, this is a steroid-like compound. And this lanosterol <coughs> is converted to argosterol, argosterol. And when we say argosterol, do you guys realize that argosterol is one of the important components of the fungal cell membrane? Yes or no? Is argosterol an important component of the, of the fungal cell membrane? Yes, okay. And the, and the lanosterol is converted to argosterol by the enzyme 14 alpha D methylase. It's converted to 14 alpha D methylase. <clears throat> That's how this reaction is happening right now. Okay. Now, um, the thing is, whenever we mention enzyme, do you guys realize that um, antimicrobials, they have a tendency of attacking these enzymes? Yes or no? Yes, antimicrobials, they always have a tendency of attacking the enzymes. So because if you can attack these two enzymes, you will prevent the uh, formation of argosterol. And as a, as a result, the cell membrane integrity will not be mentioned because uh, argosterol will not be produced. So, so th th this is one way you can target to destroy a fungi. That's one. Number two is if you target the fungal nucleus, that's another one. If you, if, you, if you target the fungal nucleus, if the fungal nucleus is not there, then obviously the genetic transcription, translation, and all of these process of fungal survival for protein synthesis will not take place. So that's another one. And the last one is if you attack the fungal cell wall, if you destroy the fungal cell wall, then obviously the uh, fungal integrity as a whole will not be maintained and there will be death of the fungi by osmotic fragility. So that's what it is. So um, now, Let's talk about the let's talk about the antifungals which attacks. First, let's talk about the enzyme. So squalene epoxide. This is the this is number one. So number one will attack squalene epoxide. Number one is that will attack squalene epoxides. Okay. This one is known as terbinafin. Terbinafin. Okay, terbinafin. And terbinafin, you can use a mnemonic such as terbinafin will terminate, terminate lanosterol. Termination of lanosterol, meaning that it will, it will not prevent, it, it will prevent the formation of lanosterol. Lanos, so terb Terbinafin terminates lanosterol. So terbinafin for terminate. So that's that's that. That's one way you can remember this. That's for terbinafin. Next one. Next one is next one is 14 alpha D methylase. Okay. 14 alpha D methylase. Okay. Now. Okay. So the so the, the next thing, the way I would like to remember this, I'm not sure if um you guys would like to remember this too is are you guys well aware of um are you guys well aware of a slang word which rhymes with azole a z o l e or a z h o l e are you guys well aware of a slang word which which rhymes with this fast answers yes or no okay so People like uh, people use these kind of words. People use these kind of slang words for other people who would who are not, let's say, contained with uh, their happiness, or like, let's say, you know, um, let's say, who would want to be rude to other people. That's how we use the slang word for those kind of people. So, in the fungal world. If any, if in the fungal world, if anyone destroys this enzyme, according to the fungi, are they that slang word or not? Do you understand what I mean? If you destroy the fungal's 14 alpha D methylase, 
okay, 14 alpha D methyl is then, then you are that word, that slang word, which I, which I'm really trying hard to not, not to mention. So this rhymes with A-Z-O-L-E, azole, okay, azoles. Now, another way you can, you are more than welcome to remember this is 14 alpha D methylase, alpha, or you can switch over the words like this, alpha zole, okay. Now, whichever you guys would like to do, would like to prefer, if you guys would like to remember the slang word, that's up to you. If you guys would remember, if you guys would like to remember this one, it's up to you. But do not confuse squalene epoxidase with 14 alpha demethylase, that is terbinafin, because my previous students, they had a difficult time um, uh, remembering that terbinafin was for squalene epoxidase and not 14 alpha demethylase. So azoles are for alpha zoles, or that slang word that rhymes with azoles. Okay. So in the fungal wall, if anyone were to destroy this enzyme, then there would be that slang word that rhymes with azoles. Now, the thing is, the uh, 14 alpha D methylase inhibitors are all the clotrimazole, fluconazole, itraconazole, ketoconazole, and then we have voriconazole. So all the azoles are 14 alpha D methylase. So I'm not going to write anything else so that's that next one next one is nucleoside uh nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor that destroys the fungals that destroys the that destroys the fungal nucleus so this one is nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor so the drug for this one is flu cytosin flu cytosin Okay, do you guys remember the flu cytosin um, in the physio video of Cryptococcus neoformans? Yes or no? Okay. Flu cytosin. Do you guys realize that adenosine, cytosine, and adenosine, then guanine, and all those all those nucleic, um, all those uh, nucleic acid structures, they kind of rhyme with flu cytosine. Yes or no? Flu cytosine, adenosine, and all those ways, right? So maybe that is one way you can remember that flu cytosine, that flu cytosine is targeting the fungal nucleic acid. Okay, flu, flu cytosine is, tar is targeting the fungal nucleic acid. Now, the next one. Next one is fungal cell wall attacking antimycobacterials. Fungal cell wall attacking anti antimycobacterials are known as echino, echinocandins. Okay. In echinocandins, you have anidula fungin, caspofungin, and mycofungin, okay, or mycofungin. So echinocandin. Echinocandins are C4 cell wall, and C4 candy. Now you can just try to remember that the outer structure of the fungal cell wall is like a candy, which is attacked by echinocandin. So echinocandin for the outer cell wall that is being attacked by this antimicrobacterial anti -mycobacterial agent. So we're done with most of the major ones. And um, we, ha we have one last one over here. So there's this um, channel Okay, there's this channel over here, this Ar argostral channel that helps to maintain the cell membrane's integrity by um, maintaining the osmotic fragility and, and allowing the ions to escape and it maintains um, the homeostatic balance. So this cell membrane over here, this cell membrane integrity is attacked by two other, um, two other antimicrobials. Now, before we do this, what was the name of the cell membrane integrity attackers of bacteria? Cell membrane integrity attackers of bacteria, daptomycin and daptomycins and polymyxines. Very good. Okay. So can we remember that polymyxine Polymyxines was the one for bacteria. 
and Pauline's P O L Y P O L Y E N E S. That can we remember that Pauline's are the ones that are responsible for attacking the cell membrane of the fungi? Yes. Okay. Yes or no? Polymyxines for antibacterial anti that will attack the bacterial cell membrane and polyenes for antifungal that will attack the fungal cell membrane. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Polymyxines and polyenes, do this sound alike or no? Okay, so polymyxines for antimicrobacterial, I mean antibacterial, and polyenes for anti antifungi. Now, okay, so we'll do a fast recap depending on the based on the uh, mnemonic. First of all, if I say terbinafin, what is the mnemonic that we used for terbinafin? Terbinafin will terminate which one? Terminate lanosterol. So, it, so what is the mechanism of action of terbinafin? What is the mechanism of action? Inhibits lenosterol, that's true. Which enzyme do they inhibit? Squalene epoxide, very good. Next one is, next one is all the azoles that attack 14 alpha demethylase or alpha 14 alpha demethylase. What are, okay, what are the names of the drugs? What are the names of the drugs? Although I did just say it, okay, I just gave away the answer myself. Next one. Next one is nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor. What is the name of the drug? Fast answers. Nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor. Flu cytosin. Very good. Next one is cell wall synthesis inhibitor. If we assume the cell wall is like a candy, then echinocandins. Okay, next one. Next one is cell membrane integrity inhibitors. Cell membrane integrity inhibitors. Okay. Now, let's jump into the text. Okay. First one. So the first one that we want to talk about is amphotericin B. And amphotericin B falls under polyenes, that is, Amphotericin B and in statin, so it falls under polyenes. Amphotericin B. Amphotericin B, it binds to the ergosterol, forms membrane pores that allows leakage of the electrolytes. So binds, it binds to the ergosterol over here, forms the pores in the membrane, and that allows leakage of the electrolytes. So basically, if you can remember that amphotericin B attacks ergosterol, that's all you need to know. So over here, I'm just gonna underline the most important mechanism, that is it binds to ergosterol and promotes leakage, okay? So binding to algosterol and promoting of leakage, they will, USMD have the tendency of using golden words to describe a particular thing. And they use the, these words to describe a particular thing over and over and over again. So either they can have this in the question stem and the answer will be amphotericin B, or they can have this in the answer stem and you have to write amphotericin B. Okay, for example, amphotericin B is prescribed um, to some extent in um, cryptococcus neoformans, okay? And over there, they tell you that you have an HIV patient with cryptococcus neoformans because um, the latest agglutination taste what, test was positive, Indian ink stain showed disc shaped with halo. And uh, they said that we already prescribed flu cytosine. What is another drug that should be prescribed? From the following answers below, please choose the mechanism of action of the drug that should be prescribed. Over there, you have for squalene epoxide inhibitors, you have 14 alpha demethylase inhibitors, then you have nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors, then you have cell membrane integrity or, or, or binding to ergosterol and preventing and uh, forming the pores to allow the leakage. From all of those, you have to choose binding to ergosterol and forming pores that allows leakage of electrolytes that will represent amphotericin B because amphotericin B is also prescribed in cryptococcus neoformans. So these are the key golden words, binding to algosterol and promotes leakage, that's all. Clinical use, is for, it's only used for systemic mycosis, okay? It's not used for 
um, your Tinias or um, any other thing. So for Cryptococcus, we use it, for example, amphotericin B, we give it with flu cytosine, and this treatment is extremely high yield. I'm just gonna underline over here. I just gave, gave you guys this exact example for cryptococcal meningitis. Then again, we can use amphotericin B for blastomycosis, coccidiotis, emitis, histoplasma, candida, mucor, and intrathically for coccidiotal meningitis, okay? Supplement potassium and magnesium because of altered renal tubule permeability. Now, this is high yield. We have to give the patient potassium and magnesium because of altered renal tubule permeability. So please expect a question from over here that in long-term amphotericin uh, treatment, the patients can be hypokalemic or hypomagnesemia will be there. If we have a patient with hypomagnesemia, what's, what sort of signs symptoms are you expecting in this patient? Fast answers, please. Anyone, anyone who has any idea about magnesium? If we have a patient with hypomagnesemia, what sort of signs symptoms are we expecting in this patient? Right, deep tendon ref reflexes, hyperreflexia. That's very good, right? Good, so that's that. So reflexes are the one to look out for. Okay, so deep tendon reflexes, please look out for that one. Next one is adverse effects. And adverse effects are our fever chills, hypotension, nephrotoxicity, arrhythmia, anemia, um, IV phlebitis is there. Now, from all of this over here, okay, what you have to remember absolutely is this one, is if you have to give a patient amphotericin B, make sure that you hydrate the patient properly to decrease nephrotoxic, because the only high yield adverse effect of amphotericin B is nephrotoxicity. And of course, arrhythmia will be there to some extent because potassium is being uh, hampered. So arrhythmia will also be there, but this is the one. There is a question in EMBOSS that is the patient being treated with amphotericin B has high creatinine and this and that. What is the mechanism of management? The mechanism of management is maintenance of hydration. So hydration has to be maintained. Liposomal amphotericin B will decrease the toxicity. Liposomal amphotericin is more, it more or less uh, prevents the adverse effects of the drug. Not very high yield, but if you want, you can try to remember this. But the things to absolutely remember from over here is binding to ergosterol, allowing the, that prevent, um, I mean, that allows the leakage, that's one. Then the treatment is all for systemic mycosis and you always have to give them potassium and magnesium. And, and adverse effect wise, it's that it's nephrotoxic and you have to maintain proper hydration, that's that. Okay, now next one. Next one is nestatin. Nestatin is also a polyne. So if it's a polyne, then it works on the ergosterol and, and allows the leakage. So the same of mechanism of action. The thing is, it also has um, topical use too, okay? Now, um, the clinical use for nystatin is very famous for oral candidiasis, okay? Oral candidiasis, we use nystatin. It's also used for diaper rash or vaginal candidiasis, but oral candidiasis is a high yield. That's all you have to know over here. Flu cytosine, flu cytosine, okay, will inhibit the DNA and RNA. Do you guys remember I said that flu cytosine sounds like adenosine and all of those nucleic acids, yes or no? So it should work in the nucleic acid, nucleic, it should work as a nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor. So it inhibits DNA and RNA biosynthesis by conversion to 5-fluorouracil by cytosine deaminase. So inhibits DNA and RNA biosynthesis by conversion to 5 fluorouracil by cytosine DMINA. So, so do you think that um, uh, flu cytosine is the actual drug or is it a prodrug? Which one is flu cytosine? Right, it's a prodrug. So over here, if you give a patient flu cytosine and they do not have cytosine deaminase, then you have a problem because this drug will not work, okay? First of all, flu cytosine has to be converted to 5-fluorouracil by cytosine deaminase, and then flu cytosine, and then 5-fluorouracil can inhibit DNA and RNA. So if 5-fluorouracil goes and inhibits DNA and, and RNA, do you guys realize that 5-fluorouracil can also attack your own DNA and RNA and cause bone marrow suppression. Is that a possibility or not a possibility? Yes, it's a possibility. So it can cause severe bone marrow suppressions. 
aplastic anemia or pancytopenia. So that's that's that. Okay. And one of the important mechanism of uh, the clinical use is exceptionally this one. You cannot forget this. Leucytosin is used for cryptococcus. Always remember, cryptococcus treatment will be tested in step one. Cryptococcus treatment is amphotericin plus flucytosin, extremely high yield. Amphotericin B plus flucytosin, extremely high yield. Okay, now next one. All the, uh, all the azoles, okay? All the azoles that destroyed the fungal 14 alpha demethylase. So alpha demethylase or four alpha zoles. Okay, all the azoles over here. That is clotramazole, fluconazole, Iso, uh, isovuconazole, over here, clotramazole, fluconazole, these are more high yield. Etriconazole, ketoconazole, the names of these are more high yield. Me mechanism of action, we already know this, that is they inhibit, they inhibit 14 alpha demethylase enzyme, right? They inhibit fungal sterol synthesis by inhibiting 14 alpha demethylase. Although it's not written over here, that, that that's the only thing you need to, you need to know, okay? And uh, they also inhibit cytochrome P450 that converts lanosterol to ergosterol. That not that high yield. 14 alpha demethylase is the one you have to focus on. Okay. Now, next one. Clinical use. It's used for um, serious and local. It's a local one, and it's used for local and less serious systemic mycosis. Fluconazole for chronic suppression of cryptococcal meningitis in AIDS patient and candida infections of all types. Okay, itraconazole may be used for blastomycosis. Now, the thing about uh, azoles are over here, you will not be asked in which uh, fungal infections do we prescribe azoles. You, do, you will not be asked this. Okay, so if you, uh, in order for you to try to memorize the clinical uses of azoles, is absolutely unnecessary. I'm going to tell you why, because they will have this mentioned in the question stand either ways. They will, they, they will paint you a picture of histoplasma, coccidiotis, porotrix, shenki, so, and they will tell you that they have used uh, an anti-fungal uh, drug that inhibits 14 alpha demethylase. What is the name of the drug? The name of the drug should be any one of the azoles over here, okay? But the only thing to focus on over here is that on a broad category, you can use azoles on local and less serious systemic mycosis. So if you can look over here, they mentioned cryptococcal meningitis, they mentioned blastomycosis, coccidiotis, histoplasma, sporothrix. Not uh, once did they mention teniasis or dermatophytes, okay? So the only thing, if you want to remember from over here, as also is 14 alpha demethylase and local and less serious systemic mycosis, that's the only one, okay? Another one is, the adverse effects of the azoles are extremely high yield because they are very particular to the azoles. That is, they are testosterone synthesis inhibitors. Okay, so close tramazole, fluconazole, isovuconazole. For uh, just this in, this in the same way, spironolactone is an antiandrogen. Okay, um, azoles, they also inhibit testosterone synthesis, causing gynecomastia, especially with keto ketoconazole and liver dysfunction that because it, in, it inhibits cytochrome P450. So azoles, the thing is for the fact that azoles cause liver, di liver dysfunction, uh, inhibition of cytochrome P450 is high yield, okay? So, but mechanism of action wise, mechanism of action wise, 14 alpha demethylase is the one you'd have to focus on, okay? But adverse effect wise, if you want to remember this, so, as a whole, you can try to remember that azoles are 14 alpha demethylase inhibitors and cytochrome P450 inhibitors. But then again, there are a lot of other drugs that are also cytochrome P450 inhibitors. The difference with those drugs and azoles are azoles inhibit cytochrome P450 to such an extent that it, it ends up causing damage to the liver. The reason I'm going to tell you why is because cytochrome P450 is a liver enzyme which is responsible for uh, converting the active metabolites and all the toxic metabolites into uh, less toxic agents so that it's easier for the body to get rid of them. Once you inhibit cytochrome P450, those metabolites and the toxic metabolites, they build up in the liver causing liver dysfunctions. So that's that. So azoles will inhibit cytochrome P450 to such an extent that they will cause liver dysfunction. Okay. So if you have to remember one antifungal drug, 
that is responsible for inhibiting cytochrome P450? It's azoles you're trying to look out for. Okay, do we have any question? I came across a question. They say antifungal that inhibits cytochrome P450. Yes, it's azoles. Okay. Okay, next one. Next one is terbinafine. Okay. Now, we all, we know the mnemonic which we just, we, which we just uh, learned, right? Terbinafine terminates lanosterol. So if you have to terminate lanosterol, you have to prevent squalene from being converted to squalene epoxide. So you, you convert, uh, you inhibit the enzyme squalene epoxidase. You inhibit the enzyme squalene epo ep epoxidase. So if you inhibit squalene epoxidase, squalene will not be converted to squalene epoxide. Clinical use wise, terbinafine is used for dermatophytosis. Now there, now we have the dermatophytosis. Oh, till now we have learned mostly about the drugs which are used for systemic fungi especially nistatin, which was not for systemic, which was more for um, local candidiasis, but all the other ones were for systemic fungi. Terbinafine is used for dermatophytes. So terbinafine terminates nanosterol, and you can also try to remember this by T for terbinafine, T for teniasis. Are we clear about this? T for terbinafine, T for, t t for teniasis for all the dermatophyte, um, all the dermatophytes, which will be targeted by the terbinafine. Adverse effect wise, it causes GI upset, headaches, hepatotoxicity, and taste disturbance, okay? Uh, not high yield, okay? The only high yield one is hepatotoxicity, terbinafine. But still, they will not be, they will not test you on this. So, so two things to focus on. Number one, mechanism of action, squarely in epoxide. Next one is clinical use, that is dermatophytosis. It's used for dermatophytosis, okay? Okay, so do I have everyone's attention? Is everyone, is everyone with me, yes or no? Okay. Um, Linden Tufuo. Dr. Linden Tufo, would, would you please identify yourself? Are you by a, um, are you a new student or can you hear my voice? Dr. Linden Tufo. Dr. Linden Tufuo, can you hear my voice? Yes, no, if I don't hear back from you, I have to put you on the waiting room. Are you a new student? Can you hear my voice? I would really love a response right now. Okay, my apologies because this is a closed lecture. Uh, if you fail to identify yourself, we will not be allowed to let you in. Okay, okay. so for now, I'm gonna put you in the waiting room. I'm not sure if you're hearing this, but if you want to come back, please identify yourself and we'd be more than happy to welcome you back. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. You're here in the waiting room and we're going to begin. Okay. Okay, echinocandins. Um, echinocandins. Okay, so let's begin with this. Echinocandins. Uh, these are cell wall synthesis inhibitors. What mnemonic did we choose to learn echinocandins with? What was the mnemonic we chose to learn echinocandins with? Fast answers, guys. Yes, candy. So, can cell wall C for cell wall C for candy C for echino. Candin. So, echinocandins are anidula fungin, caspofungin, and mycofungin. Okay, so these are the echinocandins. Now, echinocandins, they inhibit the cell wall synthesis by inhibiting the synthesis of beta glucan or beta glycan. Now, do you guys remember peptidoglycan was the cell wall structure for bacteria? For fungi, you have beta glucan. 
Okay, clinical use, it's used for invasive aspergillosis and candida infections. So in for invasive aspergillosis and candida infection. Now, over here, uh, asperg aspergillosis is the only thing that you have to remember. Okay, for example, there are just certain, um, there are certain antimicrobacterials which are very fixed for the different types of fungi. Okay, so just as how flu cytosine was important for cryptococcus, uh, aspergillosis is uh, treated very specifically with echinocandins. So invasive aspergillosis, we would try to prescribe echinocandins, okay? So try to remember asparagus, okay? Asparagus candy. If you have a candy with made of asparagus sounds absolutely horrible, but asparagus candy. Okay, would you guys like to have an asparagus candy? How does it sound? Does, does, does it sound appetizing? Yes or no? Asparagus candy? No, okay. Good, very good. Remember asparagus candy for echinocandins. Okay, short discussion to remember echinocandins. Adverse effect wise, it causes GI upset and flushing, not high yield, so you can um, Skip this one out. Next one is, let's go to grisofalvin. Grisofalvin, it, in, it interferes with microtubule function and disrupts mitosis, deposits in the carotene containing tissues or nails. Now, grisofalvin, we did not mean, we did not mention grisofalvin um, in our diagram, okay? But grisofalvin over here is also working in this portion, okay? Because inside the nucleus, when there is DNA replication, um, we have the mitosis process going on, which inhibits, uh, which interferes with microtubular function. It disrupts the cellular mitosis and it deposits in carotin containing tissue. So basically the process of spindle fiber formation doesn't happen. And then you have the cells going to different poles. I mean, you have the, uh, you have the chromosomes, which are going to the different poles, and then there is cytokinesis. And that process requires microtubular function. So if that doesn't happen, then, then DNA, um, I mean, your um, chromosomal um, division will not take place. And as a result, the cells will die away. It deposits in the keratin containing tissue or nails. So over here, okay, this sounds like a forensic question. Okay, so this has a forensic question sort of, uh, um, ability basically, uh, if there is an autopsy type of, type of question and they talk about any fungi, any antifungal that they found in the nails, then um, that that antifungal is glucosophobin, okay, because it deposits in the keratins. Clinically used wise, it's used to treat superficial infection. Exam, it's used to treat dermatophytes, okay. We read how terbinafin was used for dermatophytes and grisofalvin was also used for dermatophytes. So that's that. And the thing is, this one is, is an oral treatment. Okay, this, these ones, they are mostly um, used as a form of a topical ointment sort of a thing. Okay, now these ones are more oral. Adverse effect wise, it is teratogenic, carcinogenic, Confusion, headaches, dye, sulfur, amyloid reactions. Now, what you have to focus on over here is that it increases cytochrome P450. So uh, over here, if you give grisofalvin with any other drug, will they hamper the mechanism of action of that drug? Yes or no? Right? So this is something which you have to focus on. But if you don't focus on this one right now, we'll, we will read cytochrome P450 inhibitors and inducers later. So that's that. Another one is um, grisofalvin is carcinogenic, okay? And it has disulfidomeric reaction. And whenever you see a drug interfering with warfarin or heparin metabolism, it's extremely high yield. So grisofalvin is hampering with warfarin metabolism, carcinogenic, and it has a disulfidomeric reaction, okay? Are we clear? These are the only two things. So I have tried my best to make you guys realize uh, only the highest yield thing that you have to read from over here. The reason why I do this is because uh, so that 
when you guys enter your dedicated period and you attempt to read first aid one more time, it will be extremely easy for you because I feel like the next time you guys try to read antifungal, it should not take you guys more than two to five minutes. Okay, because the, only, the highest yield thing is the diagram. If you have this diagram in your mind, then that's 80%. And then the rest of the 20% here and there is over here, okay? So with that being said, we are uh, done with antifungal. Now we will move on to antiprotozoal. Is everyone ready? Is everyone ready? Okay. Let me ask one more time, Dr. Linden Tufuo, can you hear my voice? Can you hear my voice? If you can, can you please identify yourself? If you can't, then we we are we apologize. We have to ask you to be in the waiting room if you cannot if you, if you cannot identify yourself, and we really do not have time. Maybe just give them some time, then they will identify. Okay, so I will do that. Okay, now let's wait on Dr. Tufu and let's move on. Okay, antiprotozoal therapy. Now, antiprotozoal therapy are basically. Um, these are the drugs that we prescribe to make sure that, um, that we do not have uh, flaring of protozoals or parasitic infections. Now, these are mainly the drugs that we use for um, uh, helminths and um, then we have drugs which are used for scabies and then, then we have drugs which are used for cystose, nematodes. So those are the, and these are the antiprotozoals. Antiprotozoals are tested very specifically Okay, not a lot of anti 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 protozoals are tested. We have pyrimethamine, suramine, and melasoprol. Okay, do you guys remember uh, suramine and melasoprol for Trypanosoma brutzi? That physio video of Bruce Lee trying to fight off in Africa, and um, melasoprol was the mellow yellow can, and suramine was also there. Do you guys remember that? Okay, the reason I'm asking you this is because suramine prescribed for Trypanosoma brutzi will be tested in your step one. Only the name, only the name, not the mechanism of action, okay? Suramine soup, right? So Trypanosoma brutzi, that it's treated with suramine and melasoprol. If you can only remember the name, that's enough. And if you can remember Nifertimox for Trypanosoma brutzi, okay? Trypanosoma brutzi for Nifertimox, okay? that will also be tested. So, and then we also give sodium stebogluconate for leishmaniasis. That's not, um, well, it's high yield, but it's very, I'm sure you guys know this already. So sodium stebogluconate. Uh, a, a lot of students, they mess up suramine and melasoprol for brutzi and nifertimox for crudzi, okay? What was the mnemonic we used to remember nifertimox? Our code. Yes, what was the, um, yes, far code, right? Okay, good. So that's what we, that's what we use to remember this with. Okay, next one. Next one is anti-mite and louse therapy. Anti-mite and louse therapy over here, this is the one whose mechanism of action you are expected to know, that is permethrin green. Permethrin, okay, permethrin, it will inhibit sodium channel, inhibit sodium channel deactivation. So if you inhibit sodium channel deactivate, are you inversely activating the sodium channel? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. So what happens is parmethrin, if it inhibits sodium channel deactivation, it's actually activating the sodium channel. So if the sodium channels are extremely activated, will there be more depolarization or less depolarization? more depolarization. So isn't there a possibility that there's a possibility of electrical impulse over activity and uh, seizure-like condition in the parasites? Yes, okay. So this mechanism of action is high yield. 
parmethrin will inhibit sodium channel deactivation. Marathion, over here, marathion is an acetyl cholinesterase inhibitor. Now, I will not ask you to remember marathion, that it's an acetyl cholinesterase inhibitor, but having said that, it's still it's still tested. Okay, uh, I was um, I remember receiving one question from Amboss about melathion. Okay, that it's an acetyl cholinesterase inhibitor. Okay, if you prevent acetyl cholinesterase, what will happen to the acetylcholine? Fast answer. If you inhibit acetylcholinesterase, will there be more acetylcholine or less acetylcholine? Okay, what are the signs and symptoms of increased acetylcholine? What are the signs and symptoms of increased acetylcholine? There we go. Salivation, lacrimation, defecation, right. So that's that's that, okay. Now, and what are the, just to just to revise, what are the signs and symptoms of anti-acetylcholine or anti-cholinergic activity? Basically. Basically, you have cholinergic activity and anticholinergic activity. I want to know the signs and symptoms of cholinergic, and you guys said it's, it's uh, salivation, lacrimation, defecation. So if I say anticholinergic, it should be the exact opposite. That is dry mouth constipation, urinary retention. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so the reason why marathion, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, it's an, so if I, if I tell you that there is a question that over there, they will tell you that there's a patient who is being treated with malathion, okay? Uh, and after being treated for malathion, uh, they will not mention the name malathion. They will tell you that there's a patient who is being treated with an anti, uh, with an anti, anti protozoal or an anti mite therapy. And after being treated, these patients have an adverse effect of increased salivation, lacrimation, and uh, defecations or uh, or increased gut movement. Which drug was prescribed for that patient? The answer is malathion. Okay, because malathion is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. You can try to remember. You can try to remember this. If you cannot remember this, it's not. It's not a problem because I highly doubt you will be tested on malathion. It. It is also you. Uh, plus or minus, you can give ivermectin. Uh, it, it. It is used to treat scabies and lice. Okay, so that's that. Scabies and lice. Next one is chloroquine. This is how you mechanism of action of chloroquine. Chloroquine will block the detoxification of heme into hemazine. As a result, if heme is not converted to its inactive metabolite hemazine, the extreme amount of heme will accumulate, and this extreme heme is toxic to plasmodium species. So that's how plasmodiums die because of heme accumulation. If I if I tell you that heme accumulates, what portion which portion of the plasmodium cell do you think undergoes the issue with heme? Where does heme cause the problem? Anyone? Where do you think heme causes the problem? If heme accumulates in the plasmodia, no, I'm not talking about the human, I'm talking about the plasmodium, which organelle of the plasmodium cell is attacked by the heme? Very good, mitochondria. The electron transport chain of the plasmodium is attacked in the mitochondria and then it, it goes under cellular death, okay? Not high yield, this is not high yield. Don't worry about this. Just remember that chloroquine will prevent heme to being converted to hemazin. As a result, increased amount of heme will accumulate in the plasmodium and that will cause death to the plasmodium. Clinical use. Clinical use is it's treated to uh, it's used for the treatment of malaria, especially plasmodium species. That is plasmodium falciparum. Frequency of resistance in, in falciparum is too high. 
resistance is due to membrane pump that decreases intracellular concentration of the drug. So there are membrane pumps which will push out the um, drug from the inside the membrane to the outside. And we treat plasmodium falciferum with artimethyl lumefantrine or atovacone proguanil. Okay. Um, for life threatening malaria, we use quinidine. Okay. Especially in US, we use quinidine. Okay. So, Adverse effect wise, it will cause retinopathy and it will cause pruritus, not high yield. I have only seen questions regarding the mechanism of action. So this is something which you can focus on by itself. So prevention of conversion of heme to hemazine. As a result, heme accumulates, disrupts the mitochondrial activity in the plasmodia and causes plasmodial death. If we, if you have resistance to chloroquine, the next drug that you will prescribe is artemethyl lumefantrine or atavocon proguanil. Okay, that is what it is. This is also a side question over here. Next one. Next one is anti-helminth. Anti-helminth are treated with parental thamoate, ivermectin, mebendazole. Mebendazole is a microtubular inhibitor. Okay, you. there is a question on this. What is the mechanism of action of bendazoles? Bendazoles are microtubular inhibitors, so they prevent protozoal um, replication by preventing spindle formation, cytokinesis, and all that process. Praziquantel is um, the drugs that, where did we use praziquantel for which types of uh, helminth or which types of protozoa did we use praziquantel for? Who remembers that? Praziquantels. Tremetos, very good. We use praziquantos for the trematodes, okay? Uh, why are we not all answering at the same time? Why why am I why am I only receiving answers from one or two students? Have you guys not been doing your homeworks properly? I apologize for being just a little bit hard on you guys towards the last days, but I really, really need you guys to do the homeworks. Are you guys doing the homeworks or not? Because the reason why we are cutting the classes a bit short nowadays is so that to give you time to read microbiology. Because if we complete the classes on microbiology, at the end, if you're not doing the homework, then you will be faced with a lot of a lot of difficulty because you will have so much on your plate, you wouldn't know which one to read or which one to do. Okay, so please do the... So my question was, which type of protozoa do we use praziquantel for? Can we get some solid answers right now? For which protozoas do we use Praziquantel. For which protozoals do we use Praziquantel? Everyone, can I get some answers, please? Cystodes and trematodes. Okay, for which protozoals do we use bendazoles? For which protozoa do we use bendazoles? Nematodes. For nematodes, okay? Okay. The fact that bendazoles is used for nematodes and praziquantel is used for cystodes and trematodes, this will be tested. So please try to remember, try to remember this. The mechanism of action is not very high yield, that it, it will increase calcium permeability and vehicularization, so that's that. Diethylcarbamazine is there. Helminths get pimped. Okay, so that's not high yield. Don't worry about this. So mebendazole, mechanism of action, and the fact that praziquantel is, is, is used for cystodes and trematodes, and um, your bendazoles, they're used for nematodes. Uh, they're used for nematodes. Okay, so that's that. Now, now we will begin uh, antivirals. Are we ready to begin antivirals? Okay. Okay. Do you guys want to take two minutes before we begin antivirals and go over? Okay. I'll give you guys two minutes. Go over this page, this two page that we read. If you have any issues or if you have any questions, please tell me now while I finish drawing the antivirals. Okay. I'll give you guys two minutes. In the meantime, Dr. Linden Tufuo, can you hear my voice? Dr. 
Dr. Linden Tufuo, can you hear my voice? Yes or no? Yes, thank you. Okay. Are you a new student or um, are, are you a new student or have you been with us? Because I, because, I'm, I'm, because I apologize, I cannot identify who you are. And this is a closed lecture. You're not a new student. So uh, you have been with us for a long time. So would you please identify yourself? Are you using a different name? No audio, no problem. Are you using a different name or, or what is your email address? Okay, my apologies. Okay, so, all right. Okay, so please send us a e different computer. Okay. okay, I'm really glad that you let us know. Okay, so uh, please send us an email after uh, this, this lecture over here. Now, um, so while you guys revise, let's begin the drawing for antivirals. Is everyone done? Can we begin with antivirals? Yes or no? Is everyone done? Can we begin with antivirals? Okay, so let's begin with antivirals. Now, when we draw antivirals, okay, in the previous, uh, in the previous diagrams, we drew the bacteria and then we drew the processes that's happening inside the bacteria and how we can stop those processes. Right now, then the next one we drew was a, we drew a fungi and then we just tried to stop the processes that, that was happening inside the fungi. The difference with um, those ones and this drawing is, this cell that we have just drawn is not a viral cell, this is a human cell. And this human cell will be attacked by the virus and our, our goal is to prevent the virus from full blown causing the mechanism of its pathogenicity inside the human cell. So what's happening over here is first of all, you have this virus, okay, th that is coming and uh, trying to attach itself to the, um, to the human cells and the human cells, they have receptors, right? And the viruses, they also have these surface proteins. I'm not sure if you guys remember this. Do you guys remember the surface proteins for the virus? There was two surface proteins that we were uh, that we want, that we are, were aware of. What are the two surface proteins for the virus? Not HIV, not HIV. Virus as a whole. This is not this is not HIV. We are not discussing anti-HIV. We are talking discussing antiviral. Very good. One of them is neuroaminidase. Another one is another one is. Hemagglutinin, very good. So, which one will bind to the to, to the surface receptor? Which one will bind to the surface receptor? Okay, and what is the function of neuroaminidase? Viral release, very good. Okay, so. Now, hemagglutinin, so the hemagglutinin, for example, let's say that uh, this one is hemagglutinin, this one is neuroaminidase. So the surface protein, with the help of the surface protein, this virus over here will come and this will bind to the cell. Once the virus comes and it binds to the cell, the next process that happens is over here, there is, there is viral endocytosis, okay? So the, the virus, it enters the cell via viral endocytosis. And once the virus enters the cell, okay, via the process of endocytosis, the next, the next process is that 
this virus, okay, this virus that has just entered the cell, this virus will now try to release its nucleic acid contents. For example, it will try to release its, its uh, nucleic acid contents, okay? So it will break off a part of it and then this contents over here will be released in, into the human cell. Okay, now this, the, the viruses, they have a tendency of using the human cells as a host for their replication. So this nucleic acid that is um, released over here, the next process that this will go to is this will undergo replication and after replication, they will undergo protein synthesis. So step by step, if I have to say, first of all, I, I would say that the first process is binding. Okay, first process is viral binding. Next one is viral endo. Next process is viral endocytosis. Okay, then next one is nucleic Next one is nucleic acid release, okay? Viral nucleic acid release. Next one is nucleic acid replication, okay? And then the next one is viral protein synthesis. So for example, these are the new protein structures, so protein synthesis. And once there's protein synthesis, then there is formation of a new variant, new virus with a new protein synthesis. So this is viral assembly viral assembly and then the last process is last process is viral release okay so this again by exocytosis this viral this is basically the virus is using our human cells as a hotel room coming inside okay taking its clothes clothes off taking a shower eating something getting stronger then putting its clothes back in and they are messing up the whole hotel room and they are leaving the cell. Now, the this is new virus is again released, okay? Our goal is we have to intervene in one of these processes. Am I correct, yes or no? Is, is, is that our goal or is, is that not our goal? Okay, so our goal is to intervene in these processes, okay? So, First one is um, if we try to stop, uh, if we try to stop viral um, attachment, okay? For example, um, interferons, can, does anyone know the mechanism of action of interferons? Yes or no? Mechanism of action of interferons. What is the mechanism of action of interferons? Did we study the mechanism of action of interferons? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? Okay. Interferons, they are responsible for uh, decreasing viral protein synthesis, okay? Um, the thing is, the there are two major ways, before we start talking about interferons, there are two major ways that we want to prevent um, viral replication, okay? So we attack two, two pathways over here. So we attack this one and we attack this one, okay? Now, so on a general basis, Okay, the pathways that we can attack is one and two. Number one that we attack is we attack this nucleic acid replications and synthesis. So first one is nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. Nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. Nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors are, for example, if you want to attack um, viral nucleic acid, then the drugs over here are acyclovir, then we have gancyclovir, right? Then we have foscarnet and sidofovir. Sidofovir and foscarnet. So these are the 
drugs that will target the nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor. Do we need to come up with mnemonics to remember acyclovir as the fact that it's um, antiviral? Yes or no? The reason being is because any drug that ends in the word VIR is high, there's a high, high possibility that that drug is an antiviral. Do we need to come up with more mnemonics to remember acyclovir? Yes or no? Okay, good. Next one. So you target this, this one, and then you target this one. That is, you prevent the release of the new virus. You prevent the release of the new virus. So these are, no, these are for example, if hemagglutinin is responsible for attaching to the surface receptor and entering the cell, then neuroaminidase is responsible for exocytosis and release. So if you prevent neuroaminidase, then you can prevent the release of the virus and then the new virus will not go and cause and infect more human cells. So the new viral inhibitors, I mean neuroaminidase inhibitors are oseltamivir, also known as Tamiflu, and oseltamivir, also known as Tamiflu. Tamiflu is um, the over-the-counter antiviral drug that we find, uh, find over here. Tamiflu is very high yield because this product name is used to make step one question. So remember this oseltamivir is Tamiflu and zenemavir. Zenemavir. Okay, so these are the two um, antivirals which are responsible for preventing the release of the neuroimmunities. Now, um, let's talk about these drugs over here. Okay. First of all, let's talk about oseltamivir and, and zenemavir. Oseltamivir and zenemavir, these are neuroimmunidase inhibitors, which will decrease the release of the, pro of the progeny virus. Treatment and prevention of influenza A and B, beginning therapy within 48 hours of symptoms may shorten the duration of illness. And trust me, when they give advertisement for Tamiflu, this is the exact word, the exact sentence they use in the advertise. That if you begin the treatment with Tamiflu, you can prevent the onset of symptoms. If you start within 48 hours, you can decrease the duration of illness with that nice advertisement voice that they use in the, the whole thing, that, that this is the exact same thing they use and they are advertising. So this is what time you flew. So oseltamivir and zenamavir, the only thing you have to know about this is it's a neuroaminidase inhibitor and this will decrease the release of the progeny virus. Okay, next one. Next one are the nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. Now there are some issues with this. First of all, you have to understand which one needs which. First of all, when we prescribe nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors, there are some nucleic acids which needs to be phosphorylated or activated and some which are not, which do not need to be phosphorylated or activated. If there is a antiviral which needs to be phosphorylated or activated, is that better or um, a drug that, 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 that does not need to be phosphorylated, is that better for the onset of action? Right, so if it has to be phosphorylated, it, the onset of action will be slower Okay, and if it does not need to be phosphorylated, the onset of action should be better. So acyclovir, famcyclovir, and valacyclovir, these are all guanosine analogs. These are analogs of nucleic acid guanosine. This has to be monophosphorylated by herpes simplex virus or varicella zoster virus thymidine kinase. This is the word you're looking for. They need to be phosphorylated by thymidine kinase and not phosphorylated in uninfected cells. So if it's not phosphorylated, although the mechanism of action, uh, it's a slower onset, but the adverse effect wise, uh, drugs which does not have to be phosphorylated can cause more adverse effect. Drugs which has to be phosphorylated can cause less adverse effect. So that's that. It's a triphosphate which is formed by, which is a triphosphate which is formed by cellular enzymes. Preferentially, it inhibits viral DNA polymerase by chain termination. This is another one. Okay, so let's recap the mechanism of action of acyclovir because this is extremely high yield. Acyclovir mechanism of action, first and foremost, I need you to focus on the fact that it's an analog, meaning that the structure of the drug is the same as the nucleic acid guanosine. It has to be activated by thymidine kinase. And after activation, this will inhibit DNA polymerase by chain termination, that is, it will prevent the DNA polymerase from 
increasing the viral replication. Do you guys remember the importance of DNA polymerase in the steps of DNA replication? Yes or no? Yes. So if you prevent DNA, rep DNA polymerase, will there be DNA replication? No. No, that's that. No. The next one. Is herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus, these have weak activity against Epstein-Barr virus. So they're used for herpes simplex and varicella zoster mainly. Okay. And you have to remember this. Okay. They are not used against CMV. Always remember acyclovir for herpes simplex and varicella zoster and gancyclovir for CMV. Okay. You will have a lot of cytomegalovirus questions and they will try to test you whether you have the knowledge to not prescribe acyclovir for cytomegalovirus, okay? Because in cytomegalovirus, it will not work, okay? It's used only for herpes and varicella zoster. So acyclovir for herpes and varicella zoster. It's used for HCV, I mean, HSV-induced mucocutaneous and genital lesions as well as enterophilitis prophylaxis in immunocompromised patients. Do we have any physician over here who has treated or prescribed an order for um, meningoencephalitis that has not been tested? For example, a patient comes right away, you see that the patient has fever, headaches, seizures, and decreased responses, and your provisional diagnosis is meningoencephalitis. So we do a certain order of antibiotics while we do the blood culture and CSF analysis to um, see where and how we can specify the treatment. So on a broader category, do we have any physicians over here who has ever prescribed an order for meningoencephalitis? Anyone? Have you guys ever seen an order for meningoencephalitis? Okay, so the first order that we prescribe for meningoencephalitis is we want to target, yes, we use, so we want to target bacterial causes and viral causes because meningitis being caused by uh, fungal infections. If you can just give me, please just give me one minute, please. So um, what we were discussing was the order for meningitis or meningoencephalitis. So for meningoencephalitis, the first two uh, drugs that we prescribe are we prescribe we prescribe a broad spectrum antibiotic. So we have a tendency of of uh, prescribing a good generation of cephalosporin that will try to target both gram positives, gram negatives, and all the high yields. Okay, and we also prescribe acyclovir because. Um, if it's a meningoencephalitis, we would like to believe that the virus is a herpes simplex virus. So that's that. So that's why I, the reason why I'm telling you this is because even when you become physicians, it's not only for step one, but it's also when you become a physician, if you're not, if you're confused that whether this patient has meningitis or if it's encephalitis and you have to wait for CSF and analysis or CT scan, and if you want to start the uh, treatment right away, please start with a broad spectrum antibiotic along with the acyclovir. Prophylaxis and immunocompromised patient, no effect on the latent forms of HSV and varicella zoster. Now, velocyclovir is a pro-drug of acyclovir and it, this has better oral bioavailability. For herpes zoster use, fame cyclovir, okay? Um, not high yield, to be honest. They, they do not really specify this. As long as you remember that acyclovir femcyclovir and velocyclovir are not used for cytomegalovirus. Everything else is easy. At adverse effect wise, it can use, it can cause obstructive crystalline nephropathy. This is high yield. That is, it can cause kidney stones. Okay. And acute kidney injury if it's not ad adequately hydrated. So this had, there has to be hydration that is done properly. Which previous drug did we mention that where high hydration should be done and to prevent kidney damage? Amphotericin B, very good. And this is another one. This is another one, okay? 
mechanism of resistance is if there is a mutation of the viral thymidine kinase. Okay, if there is a mutation of the viral thymidine kinase, then acyclovir will will acyclovir will not be activated. Okay, then acyclovir will not be activated. So that's that. Now, so we're done with acyclovir. Let's go to gancyclovir. Gancyclovir is a five prime monophosphate formed by cytomegalovirus. kinase now okay now the mnemonic is cmv gain okay cmv gang so for a gang of cmv virus you will choose gancyclovir okay cmv gang for a gang of cmv virus you will choose cyto you will choose gancyclovir it's a guanosine analog once again, like this one, it's a guanosine analog, but unlike acyclovir, which has to be active, activated by thymidine kinase, this has to be activated by viral kinase. Triphosphate formed by cellular kinases preferentially inhibits viral DNA polymerase. This preferentially inhibits viral DNA polymerase. The clinical use is cytomegalovirus. It's especially in immunocompromised patients who use this. Uh, who has cytomegalovirus infection. If you have a cytomegalovirus inf infection, what are the signs symptoms in an immunocompromised patient? If it's a CMV recognitis, what do we see? What do we see? Exudative, cotton wool exudative, great retina, very good. If it's a CMV esophagitis, well, what do we see? linear ulcers. If we do a biopsy, what do we see? Intranuclear inclusions or outside body. Very good. Okay. Adverse effect wise, gancyclovir, since it's a guanosine analog, it can cause bone marrow suppression. Okay. And it's more toxic to host enzymes than acyclovir. So it was, since it's more toxic to host enzymes, that why, that's why this will cause bone marrow suppression. And obviously the mechanism of resistance is mutations of the viral kinase. If the viral kinase is mutated, then there, there would be no activation of gancyclovir. Okay, now, that's one. Please don't forget obstructive crystalline nephropathy for acyclovir, okay? So that, that's that. Next one is phoscarnate. Phoscarnate. Phoscarnate is a um, viral DNA and RNA polymerase inhibitors and HIV reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Which gene of HIV was responsible for coding for reverse transcriptase? Very good. Okay, whole gene. So viral DNA RNA polymerase inhibitor and HIV reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It binds to pyrophosphate binding site of the enzyme and it does not require any kinase activation. This is high yield. It does not require any kinase activation. It's a pyrophosphate analog, so it's already activated. Clinical use, it's used for CMV retinitis in immunocompromised patients, especially when gansaclovir fails. So when CMV gang cannot be attacked by gansaclovir, the next drug we, put, we prescribe is phoscarnate. This is extremely high yield. You will get question on this 100%. If CMV is not treated with gansaclovir, what do we what do we prefer? We prefer phoscarnate. Okay. For example, there's a mutation of a viral kinase, and you prescribe gansaclovir for a long period of time. You see it's not responding. You prescribe phoscarnate. So adverse effect wise. Phoscarnate, what I want you to have your focus on is over here. That is electrolyte abnormalities. Phoscarnate will cause hypohypercalcemia, hypohyperphosphatemia, or hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. So phoscarnate is very notorious for causing electrolyte abnormalities over here. And the mutation is that, is that there could be a mutation of a DNA polymerase. Okay, so mutated DNA polymerase. This can cause um, electrolyte abnormalities as, as such over here, okay? Next one. Next one is Cidofovir. Cidofovir inhibits viral DNA polymerase 
and it does not require phosphorylation by viral kinase. It's used for acyclovir, um, CMV retinitis, but it's mostly used for the fact that when herpes simplex is not treated with acyclovir, for example, there's a mutation of a viral thymidine kinase, and when herpes simplex is not treated with acyclovir, femcyclovir, or velocyclovir, we have to have another secondary, uh, second line drug that can be used to treat that uh, mutated herpes, and we use cytophobia. Okay, so we use cytophobia. So I'm just going to put an arrow over here, all the way to here, to make you guys realize that herpes simplex. First line treatment is acyclovir. If it fails, cytophobia. Cytomegalovirus first line treatment gets acyclovir. If it fails, foscarnate. Okay, so please remember this. If needed, write it down over here. Okay, because this is all you, this is the majority of the thing you have to know. Herpes simplex, first line, acyclovir. If it fails, then you have to prescribe cytophobia. Cytomegalovirus, first line, gancyclovir. If it fails, you have to prescribe foscarnate. Okay, so we'll write this down over here if needed for your quicker revision for the next time you study first aid. Mechanism wise, it it inhibits viral DNA polymerase. It does not require phosphorylation. CMV retinitis and acyclovir resistant. Herpes simplex long. It has a very long half life. Adverse effect wise, it can cause nephrotoxicity. So we have to administer it with probenicid and IV saline to prevent toxicity. Well, just just try to remember that most of the antivirals are nephrotoxic. Okay, most of the antivirals are nephrotoxic. Just as how most of the anti tubercular drugs are hepatotoxic, most of the antivirals are nephrotoxic. Okay. okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Question. Yes. What is your question, Dr. Osam? Yes, doctor. Can I say here? Yes, of course. What is your question? Um, about uh, gancyclovir, does it activate it by the viral uh, thymidine kinase or by our host cellular, host cellular enzyme? Which one? Gancyclovir? Yeah. Gancyclovir is activated by a cytomegalovirus viral kinase. It's um, formed by a cytomegalovirus viral kinase, but it's activated um, by uh, by by the viral kinases. Well, it, not by the host cell, by the virus themselves. So basically, you know I mean? we, we can we can summarize like it's like a cyclovir, yes, yeah? no difference by the mechanism. Well, the yeah, no, the difference is a cyclovir is activated by thymidine kinase, and again, cyclovir is activated by viral kinase. That is the difference. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. What's your name? Okay. Now, Beloxavir and Remdesivir in 2021. Okay, what does it say about Beloxavir and Remdesivir? New editions? Okay, my apologies because we are falling 2020. We have we are not following 2021. With the with the new students from next year, we would be. I mean, the next batch. Can you teach us from new one? Uh, do you mean first aid, or first aid wise? Do you want me to teach you guys from the new first aid? Okay, if I have to teach you guys from the new first aid, then I have to um, read the new first aid first. And to be honest, I don't want to teach you guys a teach you guys anything which we have not which I have not read as of yet but with the second batch of students I will be teaching them with the first aid 2021 I'm not I'm sure there's not a lot of difference between first aid 2020 and first aid 2021 um, but uh, yes for example drugs such as remdesivir and um, beloxavir if you if possible could you please take a picture of that and post it on the group so that I can uh, read and make you guys understand this mm -hmm. right away in the meantime, while we study HIV drugs. Only a few pages are added. Yeah, only a few pages are added over here. Okay. Okay, so 
are we ready to begin with the HIV drugs? And the HIV drugs. Okay. So do you guys remember we studied only half of HIV on the last lecture from physio and we kept the other half? Who remembers that? Okay, we studied only half of the HIV and we kept the other half for later. Okay, we kept the other half for later that the other half is the treatment, okay? So do you guys remember the last, the last video for HIV? Yes, we kept the farm. Okay, so let's finish it off because I need you guys to learn this because HIV medications are one of the most highest yield antiviral treatments. Come to section 14 of viruses. Okay. This is our virus overview. One second. Okay, so who uh, who can help me out by taking a picture of this after we are done? Who can help me out by taking a picture of this after we are done? Okay. Dr. M.S. Okay. Okay, perfect. Just let me, let me, let me start from the, okay. Okay. I think we, sh we, we kept it off till here, right? I remember 10, 1053 was the one. Yes or no? We kept it off till here or not? Yes, okay, perfect. So let's begin. Is everyone ready? Shall we begin? Everyone, shall we begin? Yes or no? The ideas together should help you remember that HIV infects CD4 T cells using the CXCR4 co-receptor. Now we've added a cage with a guy playing the guitar on top of it. The cage has been our symbol for the macrophage and is here to help you remember that HIV can also infect macrophages. The guy with the guitar looks kind of like a band member from the famous band Credence Clearwater Revival, or CCR. This is our symbol for CCR5, and to help make this even more clear, we've written CCR5 on his shirt. The fact that he's on top of the cage should help you remember that HIV infects macrophages using the CCR5 co-receptor. Finally, we've added another CCR band member who is whacking away the witch's soldiers with a shield. I guess you could say this guy is resistant or immune to the witch and her army. This idea is here to help you remember that CCR5 co-receptor mutations confer resistance or immunity to HIV. If the mutation is heterozygous, then the course of the disease will be slower because HIV can ultimately still cause infection. However, if the mutation is homozygous, then the patient is immune because HIV is unable to penetrate macrophages and cause disease. If we return to this overview image, you can see that GP120 interacts with the CD4 receptors and the CCR5 co-receptor when infecting macrophages. This, along with GP41, allows the virus to enter the cell and cause infection. Therefore, a mutation in the co-receptor essentially prevents HIV from entering the cell and causing infection. It's also worthwhile knowing that the co-receptor may also be referred to as a chemokine receptor. This is high yield, so I'll say it again. The CCR5 or CXCR4 co-receptors may also be referred to as the chemokine receptors. All right, now that we've talked about the structure and replication cycle of HIV, let's move on to discuss the time course of untreated HIV infections. This is a great image demonstrating the time course of untreated HIV infections. The x-axis represents time, which we can see in weeks and years. And the y-axis in blue represents the CD4 count, while the y-axis in red over here represents the viral load. So when a patient is first exposed to the virus or during the primary infection, the viral load rises, as you can see by the steep red line right here. And the CD4 count begins to fall as CD4 positive cells are destroyed by the virus. You can see this indicated by the blue line right here as it begins to drop off. The host begins to fight off the infection using CD8 positive T cells, which eliminates some of the viruses and allows the CD4 count to slightly rise. You can see that right here. Here, the virus and immune system have a tug of war and there is a period of clinical latency, and this typically lasts several years. 
However, eventually the virus prevails, the CD4 count continues to decline, and the viral load continues to rise. Once the CD4 count drops to 200, the disease is called AIDS, and the patient begins to develop symptoms. So you can see that a CD4 count of 200 corresponds to this blue line right here. And it's here that the patient has symptoms of AIDS. Because the viral load is so high and the immune system is so suppressed, the patient begins to develop opportunistic infections and eventually dies. All right, now that you understand this conceptually, let's return to the image mnemonic to help you memorize these details. As you can see, we've added another servant helper person with the number four on our shirt, which is our symbol for the CD4 cell. This servant is part of the force opposing the witch, but she appears to be having a hard time fighting against the witch's magic. If you look closely, you can see that she's holding her neck because the witch is casting a spell on her. The reference to the neck should help you think of pharyngitis. And remember that the initial HIV infection may present with pharyngitis. Now we've shown her holding a lamp, which is our symbol for fever. And this is here to help you remember that the initial HIV infection may also present with a fever. Finally, you can see that the witch has cast another spell on her, causing a green net to trap her feet. This net with little green beads on it resembles the lymphatic system and is here to help you remember that the initial HIV infection may present with lymphadenopathy. The witch is also casting a spell on this soldier, causing him to drift into a deep sleep. You can see that he's definitely sleeping because he has Z's above his head. Anyway, this sleeping person should help you remember that there is a period of latency following the initial infection. Now we can see the witch's magic emanating from her hand in the form of a blue mystical power. She's casting a spell on this opposing force in green, and even knocking some of the people off of the steep cliff. If you look at the sign next to the cliff, it says 200 feet drop. So this sign, along with the people about to fall off, should help you remember that AIDS is diagnosed when the CD4 positive cell count is 200 or less. You should also know that AIDS can be diagnosed at a higher CD4 count if an AIDS-defining illness is present. A few great examples of this would be pneumocystis idovechi pneumonia, mycobacterium avium complex, or Kaposi sarcoma. We cover all the specific AIDS-related diseases in each video corresponding to the causal pathogen, so we're not going to cover that information again here. Next, notice that we've shown the witch simultaneously shocking an enemy soldier. If we zoom up, you can see that this person is trapped in a green net, which represents the lymphatic system. The cancer hope ribbon represents cancer, and the brain being shocked should make you think of the central nervous system. So putting these ideas together should help you remember that HIV can cause primary central nervous system lymphoma. Imaging often reveals ring-enhancing lesions, so to help you remember this, we've shown the witch with rings on her fingers that are directly adjacent to the brain. This condition is associated with EBV, so we introduced a similar idea in the EBV image. The ring-enhancing lesions in an HIV patient can be a tricky topic though, because toxoplasma can also cause ring-enhancing lesions in HIV patients. So if an HIV patient presents with a ring-enhancing lesion, how will you know if it's due to EBV or toxoplasma? Let's go to our EBV image to review primary central nervous system lymphoma and answer this question. This is our image of EBV. Recall that the guy electrocuting the... I'm just going to... Um see where we start talking about the drugs. Okay, one second. Uh, I don't want to waste time. So we have discussed most, most of these things already. Is that okay? Can we move forward to, to the drugs, please? Because these are, we have discussed most of them already, so we don't want to waste any more time. One second. antibody looking arrow should make you think of HIV antibodies. Next, notice that he has a belt made of gems, which should make you think of antigens. Finally, he's pointing his arrow right at the dwarf that's holding the sundial, which is our symbol for the P24 antigen. So putting all these ideas together should help you remember that HIV is diagnosed with a combined immunoassay that detects HIV antibodies in the P24 antigen. Finally, the antibody looking arrow should also help you remember that the initial test is followed by a differentiation immunoassay, which also detects HIV antibodies. As we just discussed, a viral load test may also be performed. To help you remember this, we've shown a guard with a wheelbarrow loaded full of band-aids. I guess these are the used band-aids from all of the soldiers that have been injured. The band-aids are a symbol for the virus itself, so the load of band-aids represents viral load. Also, if you look closely, you can see a bunch of gnat bugs swarming this guy. I guess they are attracted to the nasty smell of all those used band-aids. Anyway, the gnat bugs are a symbol for the nucleic acid amplification test, or gnat. So putting these two ideas together should help you remember that a viral load may be obtained using gnat. Next, notice that we've shown a baby sign on the outside of the cell that's crossed out. I guess the soldiers don't allow babies inside of the cell. 
at least they have some laws, right? In any case, this is here next to the guide that represents the antibody and antigen testing to help you remember that this immunoassay test should not be performed when diagnosing a baby. This is because the mother can transfer HIV antibodies to the baby, making the test unreliable. Therefore, only the viral load test should be used on babies. So again, here's the diagram for your review. Now that we've discussed diagnosis, let's discuss a few more important things and wrap up this section. If we look back at the wheelbarrow, you can also see that we've added a skull on the front. The skull is here to help you remember that a high viral load is associated with a poor prognosis and may be lethal. Next, notice that we've shown a pregnant dwarf lady with a dove sitting on her shoulder. Sitting dove sounds like zidovidine. Because the dove is on a pregnant woman, this should help you remember that the medication zidovidine should be added during pregnancy to women who have HIV. This medication is important because it helps prevent the mother from passing HIV to her baby. All right, if we zoom back out, you can see that we've added several more soldiers around the well as if inhibiting these dwarfs. Remember, the dwarf on the left who's manning the pulley represents reverse transcriptase. Therefore, the soldiers inhibit. Wait one second. HIV to her baby. All right, if we zoom back out, you can see that we've added several more soldiers around the well as if inhibiting these dwarves. Remember, the dwarf on the left who's manning the pulley represent. My apologies, I'm sorry. It's reverse One transcriptase. Second. Therefore, the soldiers inhibiting this dwarf represent the medication that inhibits reverse transcriptase. And these are known as nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or NRTIs. The fact that there are two soldiers inhibiting this dwarf should help you remember that two NRTIs should be used. The dwarf on the right, tying the two ropes together right here, represents integrase. Therefore, this soldier inhibiting this dwarf represents an integrase inhibitor. Because there is only one soldier here, you should be able to remember that only one integrase inhibitor is used. So tying all these ideas together should help you remember that the initial regimen for HIV typically includes two NRTIs and an integrase inhibitor. All right, if we look back over to the left side of the image, you can see that one of the good soldiers is getting knocked off the cliff right next to the 200 foot drop sign. If you look closely at him, you can also see that he's holding some meth crystals in his hand, which is our symbol for TMP SMX. The fact that he's right next to the 200 foot drop sign should help you remember that TMP SMX prophylaxis is administered when the CD4 count drops below 200. This is to prevent opportunistic infections, such as pneumocystis hirovecchi and toxoplasma gondii. Finally, we've shown a scarecrow with a picture of the U.S. on its shirt. The scarecrow is our symbol for macrolides, and the map of the U.S. should make you think of the 50 states for a CD4 count of 50. So tying these ideas together should help you remember that macrolide prophylaxis is administered when the CD4 count drops below 50. This is also given to prevent the opportunistic infection Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC. Okay, so the main reason why uh, we were watching the video for so long is uh, over here, as you can see, there's the dove sitting on the pregnant woman for C. dovidine, okay? And then the two reverse transcriptase for, for the pole is for two NRTIs, and one integrase is the initial initial uh, regimen. That is highly, that is very, very important because as a physician, if you have a patient with HIV who comes to you and you want to start them off with anti-HIV medications, the, initially you want to start them off with two NRTIs and one integrase. And if it's a pregnant woman, then it should be zidovidine. And, and then another one, they used the macrolids and they also used, used TNP SMX. So that is also high yield. Now, with that being said, let's go back to our um, blank page over here and let's discuss the rest of the um, anti-HIV anti medications. Dr. MS, were you able to take a picture of this? Yes or no? Dr. MS, were you able to take a picture of this? Okay. Okay, is everyone on the same page? Is everyone together? Can you guys hear my voice? Which anti-HIV medication should you prescribe a pregnant woman? Which anti-HIV medication should you prescribe a pregnant woman? Okay. What, what are the two drugs for the initial regimen? What are the two drugs for the initial regimen? What are the drugs for the initial regimen? Two NRTIs and one integrase, okay? Okay, so now, okay, so now let's, um, let's, focus on, let's focus on this one, okay? So this is anti-HIV, okay? So we are, we are, we are studying anti-HIV right now. 
So uh, like the same process how in the previous one, we studied antiviral by thinking that this is a normal virus which comes and binds Okay, and then there is viral endocytosis. The difference between that one and HIV is HIV virus, when it comes and binds to the receptor, when it, goes in, when it undergoes endocytosis, it enters the cell and this process is known as viral uncoating. So the viral, so the virus takes off its coat. For example, if we try to take the example of uh, going to a hotel room, okay, this is the door of the hotel room. So you, uh, you put the key in, you take the, you open the door, you get inside, then you take your coat off, right? So the virus does the same thing. It opens the door, enters the hotel room, takes its coat off, and then what it does is it releases the nucleic acids. When it, when it releases the nucleic acid, this virus is an RNA virus. So it has to be reverse transcribed and it has to be integrated into, into the DNA. So this process, uh, in the previous one, okay, in the previous one, this process was viral replication. In the process of HIV, this is viral uncoding followed by viral uncoding of the nucleic acid followed by viral nucleic acid um, re reverse transcription, right? Viral nucleic acid reverse transcription. And then instead of protein synthesis, Okay, instead of viral protein synthesis, this pro next process is after the virus uncoats itself, releases its DNA, reverse transcribes itself, the virus will now integrate its own DNA into the DNA of the host. So the next process is DNA integration. Okay, DNA integration. So it puts its own DNA <clears throat> in the... Um, it, it puts the own DNA, it puts its own DNA into the, into the DNA of the whole cell. And now this DNA will undergo transcription, translation, and it will form the new, it will undergo the process of protein synthesis. And this will form the new viral genome, okay? This will form the new viral genome, which will be entered into a new virion and now this new HIV after being uh, after being processed will be will be released okay so this HIV will not be released so once again what's happening HIV comes binds enters uncoats releases the nucleic acid reverse transcribes since it's an RNA then integrates itself into the host DNA. Then there's a new mutant sort of a DNA with the whole, with the human and the, and the virus. And then there's the protein synthesis. Then there is, um, then there's packaging and assembly of uh, this new DNA into a new variant. And now the new variant will be released. So as a, so right now uh, we have to intervene in these processes. Okay, so, so far we have talked about the fact how zitovidine is used for pregnancy and two NRTIs and one integrase is used for initial group regimen from the physio video. Now we will talk about the rest of the HIV drugs. For example, we can uh, intervene in this process. Okay, so we can intervene in this process. That is, we can stop the binding of the virus. So if you want to stop the binding of the virus, do you have to stop the attachment of the viral surface protein to the receptor? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So the number one drug that we can give to this patient to prevent the binding of the virus to the receptor is, okay, if you know the name of the drug, please tell me the name while I write. The name is Maraviroc. Okay, the name is Maravero. This is the first one. Now, this is number one. Number two is, if we fail to prevent the viral binding, can we intervene in, in this process, viral penetration? Yes or no? Can we intervene over here? Yes? Okay, so if we intervene at the viral penetration, then the drug, that we would like to prescribe for viral penetration is N, very good. The name of the drug is N-few, N-few viritide. Okay, N-few viritide. Okay, so right now, let's say we fail to do this, 
we also fail to do this. And now the virus enters. And after the virus enters, the virus will uncoat itself. And uh, unfortunately, we have no drug that will prevent viral uncoating. So the virus will uncoat itself, the virus will release its nucleic acid, and it will undergo uh, reverse transcription. Now, this process of reverse transcription, can we attack this process of reverse trans transcription? Yes or no? Can we attack this process of reverse transcription? Yes. This process of reverse transcription is attacked by two groups of drugs. That is nucleotide reverse transcription inhibitors, NRTIs, and non-nucleotide reverse transcription inhibitors, NNRTIs. Okay, are we clear up to now? Yes or no? Are we clear up to now? Okay, next one. Next one is if we fail, let's say right now we also fail to prevent nucleotide reverse transcription. The next one is we will attack DNA integration. For example, if the virus fails I mean, if the virus succeeds in transcribing its DNA from the viral RNA, and now the virus will integrate itself into the host DNA, can we attack this one? Yes or no? Yes. So we can, the next group of drugs that we can have is viral integrase inhibitors or DNA integrases. Okay, this is known as integrase inhibitors. Okay integrase inhibitors now okay okay i'll send you the recording no problem okay next one next one is after integration let's say you fail over here okay let's say that you fail over here so you fail over here you fail at binding you fail at penetration you fail at preventing reverse transcription you fail at preventing dna integration next one is protein synthesis if you attack this protein can there be formation of a new HIV virus? Yes or no? If you attack this protein, will there be a new HIV virus? No. So your last one is you can have proteases, proteases, viral proteases. Viral proteases will, will break down this protein and there will be no new HIV. Okay. So next, next one is viral proteases. Okay, so you can give proteases. So, okay. Now, number one, viral attachment inhibitors, maraviroc, viral penetration inhibitors, and fubiritide. Let's talk about the names of the drugs for nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors and non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Okay, before we do this, Okay, before we jump into this, okay, let me make it easier by learning integrase first. Okay, integrase is easier. Okay, because all the drugs that are integrase, proteases, and NNRTIs, all the drugs except these three drugs are NRTIs. Does that make sense? Have I, is that understood? If you learn the drugs of integrase, and if you learn the drugs of proteases, then all the other drugs are reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So we know attachment inhibitors, the name is maraviroc. Penetration inhibitors, the name is enfubiridide. Let's learn about integrase, in, in, integrase inhibitors. The integrase inhibitors are DER. And every one of them have the word GR. Uh, a in it. So integrase have GRA. These drugs have GRA, meaning that there is doluto gravir, elveta gravir, and ralte gravir. So you do not have to focus on doluto gravir, elte gravir, or, or ralte gravir. All you have to focus on is the presence or absence of GRA. If GRA is present in any of the drugs, then you can safely assume that these drugs are integrase inhibitors. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Have I made myself clear? Okay. So do you have to learn about DER or can you just focus on GRA?
Okay, you can focus on GRA. Now, let's talk about protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors, these ones. Protease inhibitors, okay. Now, um, protease inhibitors, the drugs, you have a lot of protease inhibitors, right? You have uh, darunavir, then the indinavir, okay? Now, thankfully for step one, they only focus on a handful of protease inhibitors, okay? They only focus on L, they only focus on S, okay? So they only focus on L and they focus on S. That is L for lopinavir and S for sequinavir. Lopinavir, sequinavir, and sometimes, sometimes they use I, LSI, I for, I for indinavir. So lopinavir, sequinavir, indinavir. If you can only remember L and S, that's enough. That is lopinavir and sequinavir. The, re the rest of the protease inhibitors, that is you have fosemprenavir and, uh, and atizenavir, those are not very high yield. Lopinavir and sequinavir is high yield. So once again, attachment inhibitors are maraviroc, penetration inhibitors are enfoviratide. Then you have integrase inhibitors with the words GRA in it, okay? So all the graviers, proteases with only L and S. Now let's come over here to the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Now you have nucleotide reverse trans transcriptase and non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The easiest way to remember the nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors is only trying to remember the non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, these drugs are learned by the mnemonic DEN, D-E-N. D-E-N stands for delaviridine, efavirenz, and nevirapine. Delaviridine, efavirenz, and, and nevirapine. All the other drugs, for example, Zidovidine, tenofovir, stavudine, then we have abacavir, didanosine, emricitabine. The, these drugs are all nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Am I clear? Yes or no? Am I clear? Okay. Okay, now let's start from, let's start from the beginning. HIV attachment inhibitors, HIV attachment inhibitors, maraviroc, HIV penetration inhibitors, enfoviratide, HIV integrase inhibitors, and in the word, I mean, they have the words GRA in it. So delta gravir, then you have elvitagravir, raltagravir. So every, every drug with a GRA is an integrase. Protease have LSI, meaning lopinavir, saquinavir, and also focus on R, indinavir and ritonavir, okay? L-S-I-R, okay? So, SIR and L-SIR, okay? L-SIR for proteases inhibitors, lopinavir, sequinavir, indinavir, ritonavir. The rest of the drugs are obviously the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Out of the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, you have nucleotide, non-nucleotide. Easier to remember the non-nucleotide because of the fact that there are only three in number. That is den, den for, den for delaviridine, efavirenz, and nevirapine. And uh, the rest of the drugs are nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. That is abacavir, emricidavine, lamivudine, stavudine, uh, zidavudine, tenofovir. Okay, so that is the best way you can remember the drugs. Are we clear? Yes or no? Have you understood this? Everyone, if I mention uh, the drug um, zidovidine, if I mention the drug zidovidine, which group of uh, HIV medications do they belong to? NRTI. If I mention the drug uh, efavirenz and nevirapine, which group of HIV drugs do they belong to? NNRTI. If I mention delta gravir or l -mitogravir, which group of drugs do they belong to? Integrase. If I mention lopinavir, saquinavir, indinavir, 
and ropin and, and ritonavir. Which group of drugs do they belong to? Elser, protease. If I mention maraviroc, which group of drugs do they belong to? Maraviroc attachment. If I, if I mention uh, Enfu, if I mention Enfu viritide, Enfu viritide, few uh, penetration inhibitors, very good. If I mention Abacavir, Tenofovir, uh, then Stavudine, Lamivudine, which group of drugs do they belong to? NRTIs. So if you have to understand nucleotide reverse transcriptase and non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase, if you focus on the word DEN, D-E-N, is that enough? Right, that's enough. That is delaviridine, efavirins, and nevirapine, okay? Now, HIV therapy, okay, antiretroviral therapy is often initiated at the time of HIV diagnosis. The strongest indication for use is with patients representing with AIDS defining illness with a CD4 count less than 500. When the CD4 count less than five falls below 500 in an HIV patient, then we consider that the patient has full-blown acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or the viral load is high. The regimen consists of three drugs to prevent resistance, that is two NRTIs and one integrase. From the video now, can we assume that you guys can never forget the fact that you have to give two NRTIs and one integrase for the uh, two soldiers and one guy on the pole, right? Yes or no? Yes or no? From the physio videos? Okay. And also, can we assume that for a pregnant woman and a dove sitting on a pregnant woman, you will not forget that the dove eating is used for pregnant women? Yes? Okay. So that's that. All um, ARTs, okay, antiretroviral therapies, ART stands for antiretroviral therapy, are active against HIV-1 and 2 with the exceptions of non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors and enfuviritides. Enfuviritides are not um, active against HIV-1 and 2, okay? They have to be prescribed with another drug. Now, let's talk about nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor, okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> My apologies, I'm sorry. I think I'm coming up with a cold or something. Okay, okay, break. Yes, we will take a break. Just give me one second. Let me just finish age, finish the HIV drugs and then we'll finish um, to come up with a break. Now, nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Can we assume that right now it's somewhat easy for us to identify that abacavir, didanosine, and mesitabine and stavudine, these drugs are nucleotide reverse transcriptase? Yes or no? Can we assume that these that it's easy for us to understand that these are nucleotide reverse transcriptase? Now, what is the mechanism of action of these ones? That is, they competitively inhibit nucleotide binding to reverse transcriptase and terminate the DNA chain. Tenofovir is a nucleotide, the others are nucleoside. Okay. Tenofovir is a nucleotide, and the others are a nucleoside. Now, the fact that they competitively inhibit nucleotide binding to reverse transcriptase and terminate the DNA chain. This is not exceptionally high yield for you to understand. If you can only remember that these drugs are nucleotide, uh, I mean, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, then that is all you have to know. And of course, over here, you have zidovidine, which is used for prophylaxis of AIDS during pregnancy. That is another one, okay? So that is these are the only things that you have to know. Toxicity-wise, this can cause bone marrow suppression. This can be reversed with granulocyte colony stimulating factor and erythropoietin. And this can also cause peripheral neuropathy and lactic acidosis. And um, pancreatitis, didanosine can cause, didanosine can cause pancreatitis. Okay, out of all of this, the only question which you will get is this one from US Emily and UWorld. And in also our UWorld notes, we have said this, that if there's a patient who is HLA positive, for B5701, okay, we do not prescribe Abacavir. There is one question in you world, and I need you to focus on this, that Abacavir patients have to be negative for HLA B5701. So before you prescribe your patient Abacavir, you have to see whether the patient is HLA B5701 
positive or not. If the patient is positive for HLA B5701, and as a physician, you have to know this over here, okay? If he or she is positive, then you cannot give abacavir, okay? This is a very exceptionally hard question, which you have to identify, but please try to remember that HLA B5701 patients cannot receive abacavir because they will have hypersensitivity. Did we not discuss this in our UL notes? Yes or no, did we, did we discuss this in our UL notes? Everyone? A long time back, we discussed this in our UL notes, okay. Next one. Next one is non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We have delaviridine, efavirenz, and nevirapine with DEN. They bind to the reverse transcriptase at a site different from NRTIs, but they do not require phosphorylation to be active. Do not need to be, you do not need to, um, understand, I mean, put a lot of attention to this mechanism of action. Just try to remember the names and the fact that they are non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase, that's enough, okay? Rash and hepatotoxicity are common. Vivid dreams that CNS symptoms are common with evavirenz, not high yield, so do not have to focus on this. There's another thing on over here um, that you have to focus on, pancreatitis, that, that, that can be caused by dedenosine is this, okay. Uh, Dr. K W A M Z. Okay, uh, please send us an email and we'll tell you how. And for the U World notes, for the first batch of students, we are already finished with the U World notes. For the second batch of students, which we will begin next month, we will begin the U World notes again from the beginning. So please try to stick with us, and you will get the U World notes accordingly. If you have any further questions, please send us an email and we will get back to you at our service. Thank you. Next one is integrase. Okay, so G R A and GRA, okay? So they inhibit HIV genome integration into the host cell by reversibly inhibiting HIV integrase, okay? They increase creatine kinase over here, but you do, you do not get any questions for this because it's a very non-specific increase. Next one is protease inhibitor. So only, only knowing the names and the action is enough. Next ones are the protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors are, I asked you to focus on LSER, or lopinavir, sacmenavir, indinavir, and ritonavir. Your assembly will only ask you questions from these four, hopefully, okay? They will prevent the assembly of the virions depending on HIV-1 protease, which cleaves the polypeptide on mRNA. Basically, all of these things are not high yield. The only thing you have to focus on over here is that the protease inhibitors will prevent viral assembly. How will they prevent viral assembly? They will prevent viral assembly by breaking down the new modified protein that has been produced after the viral genome was integrated into the host DNA cell, into, into the host cell's DNA. So that's that. Now, the adverse effects for protease inhibitors are high yield. That is, protease inhibitors can cause hyperglycemia. That is high yield. Protease inhibitors are responsible for causing lipodystrophy. This is exceptionally high yield. You will get a question from this 100% that which HIV medication is responsible for lipodystrophy. Lipodystrophy basically means abnormal accumulation of fat in different parts of the body. Okay, for example, you can have a patient with thin arms and thin legs with an exceptionally pot bellied abdomen, or you can have patients with thin arm, thin, thin abdomen, but an exceptionally, um, uh, exceptionally obese um, thighs or, um, or in the posterior thigh region. So this is known as abnormal distribution of fat. It's known as lipodystrophy. So this happens with protease inhibitors and this is exceptionally high yield. You will get a lot of questions from here. Nephropathy, hematuria, thrombocytopenia is happening with endonavir, not high yield. Do not have to focus on this. Rifampin reduces protease inhibitor concentration. We use rifabutin instead, not high yield. Okay, next one. Entry inhibitors are attachment inhibitors, maraviroc, and penetration inhibitors, enfuviridide. Enfuviridide will bind to GP41, and attachment inhibitors will bind with GP120. This is all you have to know, okay? One will inhibit attachment with the help of GP120, another one will inhibit entry, that is, they will attach to GP41, okay? Are we clear about this, yes or no? Which ones to understand? Yes, okay. Okay, the last page of microbiology. Do you guys want to start this right now or do you guys want to take a break? Okay. 
break off. Okay, so let's take a break for 10 to 15 minutes. Let's come back, let's finish this off. And let's see if we can begin with a little bit of pathology. Okay, these are relatively very easy to understand. Uh, you guys will not get a lot of questions from pathology step by step, or you, you do not have to obviously memorize pathology. No one, no one memorizes pathology. You have to understand pathology. If you don't understand pathology, that, that would be an issue. So we, we will come back and we will talk about pathology. Okay, after finishing this one. Okay, how long do you guys want to take the break for? Fifteen minutes or twenty minutes? Okay, so it's 11.51. Let's try to be back by 12.05 to 12.10 and we can begin. Let's leave and then come back.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, Dr. Grabasi is back, Dr. Jordan, everyone's back. Okay, so let's talk about hepatitis C, and this is the last one. The drugs of hepatitis C are extremely, extremely annoying. Okay, they are extremely annoying. <clears throat> Hopefully, um, I will try to do my best to make you guys understand how there's a, how you can remember um, these drugs, okay? Okay. Hepatitis C drugs, uh, annoying or not annoying? Hepatitis C drugs, yes, extremely annoying. Okay, so hepatitis C drugs. Okay, so these are the, these are three words which I want you to focus on. That is A, B, and three, four, A. A, B, and three, four, A, okay? Then the next words that I want you to focus on is this. That is, P, A, B, U, P, R, E. Okay, this makes absolutely no sense. Um, uh, but this is the way which um, I think it will be a bit easier to remember the names of the drugs instead of trying to learn right away. So A is PA, B is BU, 3 by 4A is PRE. Okay, just give me one second, please. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you have A, you have B, and then you have three, four, A, three, four, A. So A is P, A, B is B, U, and three, four, A is P, R, E. So with this, you have, with this, you have A for NS5A, B for NS5B, and 3,4A for NS3, NS4A. A for PA, okay? Because the number one drug is, the only one drug you have to remember is Ledipasvir. Then um, over here, your uh, B for BU, that is Sophosbovir, the only one drug. You have to remember only one drug. Over here is Ledipasvir. Over here is Sophosbuvir. And NS3, NS4A is PRE. PRE, you only have to remember uh, Simiprivir. This one. Okay. Okay. But out of all of this, the only questions that you will, uh, I mean, out of all of this, if I have to rank which ones are the highest yield out of A, B, and 3, 4A, it is this one. Okay, so hepatitis C is a chronic hepatitis C infection treated with multi-drug therapy that targets a specific step within HCV replication cycle and HCV encoded protein. Examples of drugs are provided. For example, NS5A inhibitors, 5A for PA, that is ledipasvir, 
inhibits NS5A, which is a viral phosphoprotein that plays a key role in RNA replication. You do not have to remember the mechanism of action. If you can only really remember NS5A, that's, it, that's enough. Uh, the thing is more so than uh, often, they use these drugs in, uh, uh, to see whether you can exclude these drugs when you are trying to answer questions from another part of antimicrobacterials. I mean, antimicrobacterials. That is, um, for example, um, if you have a question regarding virus, for example, they want you to identify, um, they want you to identify an NRTI, okay? Over there to confuse you, they can have the name of Sophus bovir. And if you're not confused, if you're not sure that drugs such as abacavir, tenofovir, zetovidine, lamivudine, stevudine, these are only NRTIs, then if you choose Sophus bovir thinking it's HIV, then it's a wrong answer. So on most cases, these drugs are used to exclude away your answers, okay? So you do not have to understand the mechanism of action because to be honest, it's beyond the scope of step one and most of the mechanisms are not known because these are very new drugs. So this inhibits NS5A, this inhibits NS5B, which is an RNA dependent RNA polymerase acting as a chain terminator. And this one is a viral pro protease. This one is a protease. So over here, um, over here, this is basically a phosphoprotein. This is basically a protease, okay? And this is an uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. This is just a polymerase, okay? So you can concise your knowledge accordingly, okay? So NS5A, phosphoprotein, NS5B, polymerase, NS3, NS4A is a protease. Last one, this one is high yield, ribavirin. Ribavirin is high yield because ribavirin it inhibits the synthesis of uh, guanine nucleotides by competitively inhibiting inositol monophosphate dehydrogenase. IMP dehydrogenase, it inhibits IMP dehydrogenase and inhibits the synthesis of guanine. It is used as an adjunct in cases refractory to do newer medications. So IMP dehydrogenase and ribavirin, this is also used for hepatitis C treatment. This is high yield, okay? This can cause hemolytic anemia and it is severely teratogenic, but, um, it, but um, <clears throat> it's still prescribed. And this drug is very effective for treating hepatitis C. Okay, are we clear about this, yes or no? IMP dehydrogenase, inositol monophosphate dehydrogenase that is used in purine pyrimidine pathways that is inhibited and that drug is ribavirin. Okay, now, NSSB stands for, I, I have, and honestly, I have no clue because to be honest, I did not try to understand this. All I tried to remember was um, this exact piece of information that's here and that's all. Yeah. Yes, it's not that important. All you, have to all you have to remember is you will get questions regarding Sophos Bovir uh, where they will only try to know the name. That's one, if they try to make hard questions or they can try to make questions where they can try to exclude whether you have knowledge about hepatitis C or not, I mean HIV or not. So they can add these drugs in the answer stem to see whether you can exclude them away. Okay, so that's that. Next one. Next one is disinfection and sterilization. Are we ready to begin sterilization? Everyone? Okay. Disinfection and sterilization. Goals include the reduction of pathogenic organism counts to safe levels and the inactivation of all microbes, including spores. So getting rid of the spores is sterilization and disinfection means that you decrease the amount to a safe level at which it's not infective, but the organisms are still there. Sterilization it causes complete absence of the organism. Autoclave, autoclave for over here, the questions that you have, will have to uh, <clears throat> that you have to understand is, first of all, the mechanism of action and which ones are sporicidal and which ones are not sporicidal. So for sporicidal, we will use red. For non-sporicidal, we will use blue. That is, autoclave is sporicidal, okay? Autoclave is sporicidal. It's pressurized steam at 120 degrees Celsius. It, sporicidal means it decreases the spores. I mean, it kills the spores, but it may not kill the prions. For example, the prions for uh, Crossfield-Jacob disease or Kuru, 
right? So they, that may not kill the prions. Alcohol. Alcohol will cause protein denaturation and disruptions of the cell membrane. Okay. Okay. You just give me one second. First of all, let, let's let's talk about this. When you want to kill a bacteria, autoclaving is one mechanism where you increase the temperature and you increase the pressure. That's one. Then there are mechanisms where you where you can damage the bacterial cell membrane. If you damage the bacterial cell membrane, the cytoplasmic content will go out and this will uh, result in the death of the bacteria. So denaturation of uh, proteins and disruptions of the cell membrane are basically done with the help of alcohol, okay? Then you can do it with the help of chlorhexidine, right? Chlorhexidine. And then um, there's another one that is, um, that is quaternary amines, okay? Quaternary amines, although, although that's not very high, your quaternary amines will also disrupt the cell membrane. Another one of uh, killing, another one of, another way of damaging the bacteria are if you induce free radical formation, okay? Free radical formation, obviously, when I say free radical, the first thing that should come to your mind is hydrogen peroxide, okay? And another one that you can do is halogenation, meaning that you can increase the amount of halogens in the DNA and RNA. So having said that, alcohols will cause protein denaturation and disruptions of the cell membrane, and alcohols are not sporicidal, okay? Meaning that they will only disinfect, but they will not kill the spores. So alcohols are not sporicidal. Chlorhexidine, once again, will denature the protein and disrupt cell membrane. They are not sporicidal, okay? Then, Quaternary amines will impair the permeability of the cell membrane and they are not sporicidal. Okay, so uh, except alcohol, chlorhexidine, and quaternary amines, can we assume that the rest of them are all sporicidal? Yes or no? Okay, so except alcohol, chlorhexidine, and quaternary amines, all the other methods of disinfections are sporicidal. Am I correct? Yes or no? Yes? Okay, good. So the other ways, so, so this is your first uh, question that is answered from sterilization. That is, which methods are sporicidal? Which methods are not sporicidal? So only the methods which are not sporicidal are alcohol, chlorhexidine, and quaternary amines. And the rest of all the processes are sporicidal. For example, chlorine, which will cause oxid, uh, which will cause Ox oxygenation and denaturation of the protein, they are sporicidal. So chlorines are sporicidal. Ethylene dioxide, they act as an alkylating agent, they are sporicidal. Over here, you will receive questions from chlorine. Okay, you will receive questions from iodine and iodophore. That is which ones are halogenators. A lot of students, they have the tendency of, of um, answering chlorhexidine as, as halogenators. But that's a completely wrong answer. Halogenation will be done with iodine and iodophores. So ha halogenation of DNA and RNA, this is sporicidal. This is done with the help of iodine. Free radical oxidation and sporicidal is also hydrogen peroxide. This, this will increase the free radicals. Sporicidal. So you can also receive questions from hydrogen peroxide. You can, you, you can, it's not like you can, you will. You will receive questions from hydrogen peroxide. You will receive questions from iodine. You will receive questions from chlorine. You will receive questions from autoclave and you will receive questions from chlorhexidine. That's a given. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Are we clear? No. Okay, so disinfection, can you repeat? Yes, of course I can. Basically, disinfection is decreasing the amount of organisms to a, to a low level at which it's not pathogenic, okay? And sterilization is completely killing off the organism that will decrease it, and it will also um, uh, kill the spores, okay? So that's that. Now, there are different methods of sterilization. First of all, you have the sporicidals and the not sporicidals. Sporicidals are the ones which destroys the organism along with the spores. <clears throat> so it's easier to learn the not sporicidals because they are few in number. The not sporicidals ones are alcohol, chlorhexidine, and quaternary amines. If you can remember them, all the rest are 
um, sports idols. Then you will have questions regarding the method. That is, they will have questions where they will ask you that they did a process of sterilizations where they caused halogenations of DNA and RNA of the bacteria. What was the method of sterilization used? The answer is iodination or iodophores. Then you can have another type of question where they can ask you that there is a method of sterilization used where they induce free radical formation. What was the method of sterilization used? The answer is hydrogen peroxide. Another one is they can also ask you <clears throat> that, um, that um, alcohol and chlorhexidine, do they cause disruptions? I mean, alcohol and chlorhexidine, what is the mechanism of actions of their sterilization? That is protein denaturation and disruptions of the cell membrane. That is that. So that's all about disinfection and sterilization and most of the questions of disinfection and sterilization. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? <clears throat> okay. Are we clear? No. Last one. Antimicrobacterials, antimicrobials, sorry. I don't know why I have the tendency of saying antimicrobacterials. It's antimicrobials. Antimicrobials to avoid in pregnancy. Antimicrobials to avoid in pregnancy is safe children take really good care. Safe children for sulfonamide, aminoglycoside, fluoroquinolones. Children take really good care for clarithromycin, tetracycline, ribavirin, grisofalvine, chloramphenicol. Okay, safe children take really good care. Um, this is the mnemonic which I love to use myself too. So that's that. Once again, it's sulfonamide, aminoglycoside, fluoroquinolones. Safe children, C for clarithromycin, Take T for tetracycline, really for ribavirin, good for grisofalvine, care for chloramphenicol. So that's that, okay? Now, uh, the adverse effects are connectors for sulfonamides, aminoglycoside will cause autotoxicity, which we have discussed before. Fluoroquinolones will cause cartilage damage. We, saw, we discussed this before too. Tetracycline, okay? Do you guys remember tetracycline? I said tetracycline for discoloration of the teeth, yes or no? Who remembers tetracycline? Okay, then ribavirin, ribavirin, it just said, we just studied that it said it was severely teratogenic, so ribavirin is there. Grisofalvin, cytochrome P450 inhibitor majorly will cause he hepatic dysfunctions in young babies, so it's teratogenic, and chloramphenicol can cause green baby syndrome. Chloramphenicol right now is obsolete, we don't use it, but if someone were to use it, it's going to cause green baby syndrome, okay? Are we clear about this, yes or no? Yes? Okay. So with that being said, my friends, we are done with microbiology. Okay. So are we still 100% done with microbiology? Yes or no? No. What do we have to do? No, we don't have to do questions. We have to learn. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure because I'm not testing you guys as much as I used to. Okay, I'm not really testing you guys as much as I used to because I'm trying to give you guys time to learn everything. But can I get some feedbacks from all the students regarding if they're very honest? Can you guys tell me if you guys really were doing the homework or not? Yes or no? Did you guys do the homework? Because if not, it's 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 not a big deal. Just I just want to let you know that you, you have to. Everyone, okay, Dr. Midullah, thank you. Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Lala, Dr. Adnan. Dr. Jan, Dr. Osama, not complete, no problem, okay? Okay, Dr. Dahlia, Dr. Garbasi, you were sick, no problem, okay? How about, okay, Dr. Allison, Parda, okay? How about Dr. Evelyn and Dr. Naud, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Sabira Khatun, Dr. Amber Bashir, Dr. Fagan, Dr. Sarah Suleiman? How about you guys? Microbiology is very, very high yield, okay? Microbiology is very high yield. You will receive a lot of questions from microbiology in each and every block per se, okay? It's confusing, but going to read more. Okay, good. We have to complete the system that we skipped to, not complete. You do not have to complete the system you have skipped. Um, <clears throat> we did not skip that system. The thing is, that is for revision only. So if you want, you can 
if you want, you can read that in your dedicated period. Okay, if you can read that in your dedicated period, you can skip that out, skip that one out right now if needed. Okay, are we clear? Okay, so to, uh, today, do you guys want to start pathology or do you guys want to do questions from microbiology? Which one? Because it's been a while since we did questions, am I correct? Questions, okay, good. Okay. Right. So let me upload the questions from you world <clears throat> and then let's do the questions. In the meantime, you guys are uh, more than welcome to take a short five minute break. Okay, just give me, just give me one minute. Do you guys remember the treatment for clusters for clostridium for clostridium difficile? Who remembers the treatment for clostridium difficile? Can you guys hear my voice? Do you guys remember the treatment for clostridium difficile? Metronidazole will cause Clostridium difficile. Clindamycin may cause, uh, metronidazole may cause Clostridium difficile, but clindamycin will cause Clostridium difficile for sure. Okay, so let's upload the questions. Okay, if you guys could please go to the um, Facebook discussion group. Okay, if you guys could go to the Facebook discussion group over there, I have just uploaded the questions <clears throat> from my phone. And, I, and over here in the meantime, I would also go to the Facebook discussion group and see the questions from there. You guys are more than welcome to download the questions and enlarge them or do whatever.
Okay. Did you guys go to the Facebook discussion group? Can you guys see my screen over here? Yes or no? You guys can't see my screen? Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes or no? Now? Yes, okay, just give me, give me one minute. So um, are we ready to begin? Okay. So let's begin with this. This is the first question uh, over here, which I uploaded in the Facebook discussion group. I'm sure you guys can see it from there or you guys can see my screen, whichever you guys prefer. This is a four-year-old boy is brought by, to the physician by his mother with decreased appetite, abdominal cramps, and diarrhea. The stools were initially watery but they have become bloody. On physical examination, his temperature is 100.4. So you underline bloody, you underline the temperature. There are signs of dehydration and mild distended abdomen and diffuse pain elicited on palpation. Stool studies are positive for fecal leukocytes and alcohol blood. They grow non-lactose fermenting gram negative rods on McConkie agar. So if they're non-lactose fermenting, can they be E. coli, Klebsiella and all those things, Cytobacter and Seracia. Yes or no? Okay. This bacteria will ferment glucose without gas production, do not generate hydrogen sulfide. Which bacteria do not generate hydrogen sulfide when they are grown on triple sugar iron? <clears throat> Okay, so do you, so when I told you guys that that on microbiology, the only high yield things are the tables. Was I correct or not correct? <clears throat> so you don't even have to um, think about this. Which of the following bacterial factors is the important is important during pathogen during pathogenesis? Which one is important over here? Which one does will will Shigella do? If you guys are ready, please tell me you're ready, and let's provide the answer. Shigella's mechanism of action, which one will it do? Okay, what is the answer? Shigella? Which one will cause the disease? Okay, some of you guys are saying A because of the toxin it produces, but over here, look at this. This patient already has dehydration, but they have bloody diarrhea. Which, which one of this factor is responsible for bloody diarrhea? <clears throat> okay, mucosal invasion. So the answer is mucosal invasion. 56% said mucosal invasion and 36% said exotoxin. Exotoxin would have been the answer, okay? Exotoxin would have, would have been the answer. Um, 
Uh, if there was, yes, if there was a presence of hemolytic uremic syndrome, then yes. If there was schistocytes, then yes, you know. So uh, in case of Shigella pathogenesis, mucosal invasion is more high yield than exotoxin production, okay. So that's that. And since the patient already has bloody diarrhea, so bloody diarrhea is the one, okay. Are we clear? Are we clear? Shigella produces endotoxin. Do you guys remember the exotoxin page over there? Okay. Which organism was responsible for producing Shiga toxin? And which organism was responsible? Shigella. So I'm not, I'm not understanding which, what you guys are saying right now because uh, it's Shiga toxin for Shigella and another one was um, entero, tox, entero pathogenic, um, I, I mean, another one was E. coli, right? Which, which produces Shiga-like toxin, okay? So that, that. Shigella will produce both exotoxin and endotoxin. Okay, Shigella would, would, would produce both endotoxin and exotoxin together. Yes, it's enterohemorrhagic E. coli, right? Okay. Okay. Now, let's read this one, next one. A 32-year-old Caucasian male develops profuse watery diarrhea with abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting during a trip to Mexico. The diarrhea resolved in a couple of days without antibi antibiotic. This is extremely easy. If you guys know the answer, please say you're ready. What is the answer? Right. So profuse watery diarrhea, self-limiting within one week without antibiotic. The organism is cholera, vibrio, vibrio cholerae. Okay, the vibrio cholerae. That's clear. Okay, that's traveler's diarrhea. Next one. Next one. A 62-year-old man is hospitalized with severe abdominal pain and diarrhea. In the last year, he has had two episodes of Clostridium difficile colitis. His past medical history is significant for diverticulitis and upper GI bleeding. He is allergic to penicillin. After appropriate workup, Clostridium difficile, the patient is placed on anti on an oral macrocyclic antibiotic that has bacteriocidal activity and minimal systemic absorption. Which one are they talking about? Fast answers, please. Oral macrocyclic, macrocyclic. Which one has minimum absorption? Out of vancomycin and fidoxamycin, which one has minimal absorption? Right. Which one is the correct answer? Okay. Okay. The percentage of students who said vancomycin was 36%. The percentage of students who said fidoxamycin is 20%, 20%, okay? So it's a pretty difficult question. But always remember, Clostridium difficile, more often than none, the answer is Fidoxamycin, okay? Fidoxamycin. Are we clear? Let's go to the next one. A 65-year-old man comes to the physician due to right calf pain, redness, and swelling. He has cellulitis and is started on clindamycin. A few days later, he develops watery diarrhea and abdominal cramps. So it's Clostridium difficile. Again, the toxin most likely responsible for this recurrent condition primarily damages which of the following components of the intestinal mucosal cell. Okay, this is from the table, from the table, which we have learned. If you guys are ready, please tell me you're ready. Okay. 
Okay, Dr. Adamnam, Dr. Hosam, you guys are ready. Who else is ready? Dr. Fagan, Dr. Dahlia, Dr. Jordan. Okay, since most of you are ready, what is the correct answer? Very good. That is absolutely brilliant. It is cytoskeleton abnormality. Okay. Cytoskeleton abnormality. B was confusing. Yes. Cell membrane integrity. B was a bit confusing. But which one is B? Loss of cell membrane integrity is more characteristic of perfringes. Very good. It's more characteristic of perfringes. Next one. Okay, a 68 year old woman comes to the emergency department due to a rash that appeared on her chest. Her past medical history is significant only for hypertension that is well controlled with medication. The patient receives annual influenza vaccinations. Okay, focus on the first uh, complaint the patient has, that's a rash. Uh, the temperature is normal on examination. A unilateral vesicular rash involving a single dermatome is present on her chest. Okay, I'm pretty sure you guys know which virus this is. Okay, which of the following is the patient most likely to suffer from within the next six months? Okay, if you guys are ready, what is the correct answer? What is this condition called? Very, very good. Okay. Shingles. Okay. Can I get a link to discussion group? Yes, of course, of course you can. Please send us an email. We'll send you the link. Okay. So that's that. So with that being said, we're done with the first five questions. How do, you, how do you guys feel about the question? Do you guys think that after you guys do another uh, revision or you read the, pro, read the microbiology things which we asked you to read properly, will it be easy or not easy? Okay. This is basically, okay, this question is herpes and the thing is um, this is post herpetic neuralgia do you guys we have talked about post herpetic ne neuralgia am i correct yes or no post herpetic neuralgia yes this is post herpetic neuralgia okay but whichever you guys thought it was the answer was correct because persistent local pain is the correct answer okay now, so with that being said, we're done with the questions for today. We're done with microbiology. From tomorrow, we will begin pathology. And um, if that is all, then I would like to end the lecture over here today in the hope that you guys would be done with the questions. I mean, you guys will start doing the questions yourself. And at the same time, you guys will start revising. Is that the plan? Yes or no? Is that the plan? So our lectures on microbiology, were they helpful or not helpful? Just wanna know, just, just wanna have a feedback because accordingly we, we can change next time. Okay. So, um, the, okay, so thank you so much. I'm really, really glad that you guys feel this way. Um, the reason is because um, we actually try to put in a lot of uh, time into how we will deliver this lectures to you all. And um, the, the thing is, since most of you guys will be leaving very soon, we would be uh, we would be expecting a new batch of students. So if you guys uh, really like our lecture, we would highly appreciate if you guys uh, could give us a review or a feedback or, a, or anything which can actually help us uh, get uh, new students or students who can reach us because a lot of students, they need a lot of help, but they do not know who to, who to go to because USMLE step one tutoring over here is very, very expensive. Okay, but we do it mostly because um, we want to do it. 
and an, another one we try to keep it as cheap as possible and as affordable as possible to um, to um, pricing as low as one dollar per hour. So that, that because our lecture timings are usually from three to four, five hours per day. So if our lectures are done, so we end it before, but if anyone has a question, we are available for the next uh, two hours. So that's, that's that. Okay, so thank you so much for doing the lectures. I uh, hope you guys do the homework. If everything is great, um, if everything is great, um, I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay, Dr. Garbasi, thank you so much for doing that. We really, really appreciate it. Hope you guys have a great day once again. Uh, if all is well, I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. I'll try to make sure the lecture starts early by nine, okay? If not, I'll, I will send you an email, okay? All right, thank you so much guys. And thank you so much, Dr. MS for having our back, okay? Thank you so much. Have a great day, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, do we have a question? No, just thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, have a great day. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, see you guys tomorrow. Bye bye.